Welcome, everybody, to the Dan the Wolfman podcast. I said it months ago that I was hoping to get the one and only five-time world champion, Kathy Long, also actress and uh, all kinds of things, fought in boxing, even fought MMA. And so welcome to the podcast, Kathy Long. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm doing better. It's great to kind of see you after all these years. Guys, I haven't seen Kathy in about probably seven or eight years. Uh, I needed yeah. a ride at like 4.30 in the morning to get me to the airport <laughs> to, to go to the Middle East for a little while. And uh, I got the one and only Kathy Long. She's so nice to actually pick me up and drop me off at the airport. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Of course. That. It, was, it was my pleasure. I had no problem doing that. You know, it's what yeah, friends do, right? That's yeah. what friends do. I think I gave you a pair of tie pads. We'll get to that. I'm sure you've probably made use coaching people. I, I, I hope that you've gotten good use of those tie pads. I gave you some um, Muay Thai Academy. I gave a pair. I gave my 45-pound dumbbells over to Gokor. So, uh, you know, I, I left my little gifts of, of, of training uh, that I'm sure did better than, than I could have. So, uh, anyway, thank you very much. And, and guys, you're I'm welcome. just really happy to get Kathy because if you're not familiar, some of my younger viewers, it looks like we've already got senseis. We've got people from Russia. We got uh, 80s, 90s action movie YouTuber Viking Samurai already joining in, which is great. Uh, and I'm sure in about 15 minutes, we'll probably get a whole more um, jumping in as we usually do. Guys, Kathy paved the way uh, for female kickboxing. She was the first female combat sports athlete that that really blew up and got worldwide media attention on the covers of uh, all the magazines and um you know looking at women's mma today i think she really paved the way and those ladies uh really should pay her respect and so i'm just happy to get you on the channel so thank you very much kathy do you want to start just kind of going into your background growing up and 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 how you uh eventually got into martial arts and all that um sure that's what you'd like me to do <laughs> yeah i i started martial arts when i was 14 years old i had a friend in high school who invited me to take aikido with her and I came into the class, and I was uh, greeted by this gigantic guy um, who he was a postman by day, Ron Granville. He was a postman by day and an Aikido instructor at night. And he had the kindest demeanor, and he was very, had a very nurturing and, and loving atmosphere in his school. And it was something that I really gravitated to because I didn't have that at home. So um, I stuck with that until I got my black belt. And then I started studying uh, Kung Fu San Tzu with somebody else. And from there, <clears throat> I, while I was studying Kung Fu San Tzu, I was also learning Wing Chun and Kali and JKD. Okay. And I would, I would go to tournaments and just, you know, compete in forms because in, with Kung Fu San Tzu, you can't compete with that. You stick the fingers in the eyes, you hit people in the windpipe, you stomp on their knee, uh, you crush their testicles, it, things that actually work in a fight, so you can't compete with that. <clears throat> but there was this one girl who kept nagging at me to have a point fighting competition with her, and I just said, look, you know, I, I don't do that type of fighting. Um, so her martial arts instructor, I'm trying to be nice about it, but uh, her martial arts instructor called mine and asked if I'd be willing to do an exhibition, or hear the air quotes, exhibition kickboxing bout against her. She weighed 190, I weighed 120. She had had two years experience, I had zero days experience, and I only had 10 days to prepare. And they said, I said, what are the rules? Well, you have to wear gloves. And I'm, I was used to training yeah, with limitations. So in that respect, I was like, all right, whatever. Um, we were allowed to wear gloves and we had to wear shin guards and headgear, but I, was, I could hit her as hard as I wanted. And I thought, okay, let's do it. 
<laughs> so I had 10 days to learn how to, uh, to do any kind of boxing. And we had our competition. And it was an exhibition. Do you remember about how, old, how, how old were you at that time? So you already got your black belt in Lakita. Were you now like 18, and, 19, and 20 or what? I was 23. Okay. 23 when I started kickboxing. And, you know, the, here's the funny thing about it. Um, you know, I was so scared that I, I, I treated it like, you know, I remembered watching, because I grew up watching Muhammad Ali and I studied him, you know, I studied his fighting and I studied Sugar Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler and all the, all the greats at that time. Right. And I remember when she would go to the corner after the bell rang, I'd be standing there saying, what are you sitting down for? Come on, let's just keep fighting now. You don't need a rest. <laughs> and I was just egging her on um, because I was really scared. I didn't want her to know that. Yeah. And every time we, you know, she'd get up and the ring started, the round started, I was just, hitting her as fast and as hard as I could because I was so scared. And at the end of the fight, it was supposed to be an exhibition. Well, the referee says, hey, or the announcer says, hey, everybody, they're telling up the scores right now. And I looked at, I looked at the guy and, and my trainer looked at the guy, my Kung Fu instructor, and he said, he walked up to the guy, put his arm around his neck and I said, I tell you what, this is an exhibition. And if you announce a winner right now, I'm going to break your arm. Right here and right now, I will break your arm. Do you want that? And the guy's like, um, give the ladies a hand. It was a great exhibition. <laughs> so of course, there was no winner announced because the weight yes. class was just, I mean, she weighed 190, I weighed 120. Come on. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. How, um, let me ask, where did you get, like, in the ring? I mean, you're such a sweetie. But in the ring, you were pretty ruthless, and you just kind of went into that. Was that? Something you always had in you, or does that come out from like kind of the reality self defense training or the Kung Fu San Su, or, or kind of where did that fire come from? Well, several things. One, um, midway through my Kung Fu San Su training, before I got my black belt, um, one of my training partners uh, swept me really hard and I hit the ground. I hit the ground so hard, something woke up in me, something that was had to have been laying dormant for a long, long time. And I was suddenly just wanting to rip people's faces off. I, I just wanted to tear through people and hurt them as badly as I could. And I remember getting up from being swept to the ground and I got up as fast as I could and he threw another strike and I swept him hard and bounced his head off the floor. And I was just ripping through people. And the harder they threw me down, the harder I would throw them down. And it just got to the point where for a couple of weeks there, nobody wanted to work out with me because I, they were, I was hurting everybody. And I didn't care how hard they threw me down or how hard they hit me. I didn't care because whatever, whatever woke up in me was alive and starving, hungry, really hungry. And it took uh, some time to temper that, um, to take control of that and not, not get rid of it, not, not, but just have it ready when it's mm -hmm. necessary, not necessarily beating up your friends because you never want to hurt your training partners ever. Right. Yeah. I mean, it happens sometimes, of course, um, in martial arts, especially, but in boxing and kickboxing, it's hard to avoid. Um, in MMA and in Muay Thai, it's, it's hard to avoid hurting your friends. Um, especially if you're, they're your main sparring partners. Um, so when I got into fighting, uh, I don't know, it just, it was, though I was very afraid, you know, fear is a huge motivator for me. And in that flight or fight syndrome where people either freeze under pressure or they thrive under pressure, I guess I'm the latter. Um, because the more afraid I was, the faster and harder I'd hit people. Because <laughs> yeah. I just didn't want to get didn't want to get hurt, right? Um, and then on top of that, uh, I, 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 it was my goal and my focus to be in better condition than anybody I fought against. And, you know, I... I Every time my coach saw that I was able to do something and it looked to him easy, then he would find a way to make it harder, no matter what. Uh, everything that he did, I, if I was going through sparring partners and, and it looked like I was getting through them pretty easily, then he'd find harder sparring partners. He'd find professionals when I was just an amateur. And 
I got the crap beat out of me constantly. But by the time I got in the ring with a woman my size and my weight, there was nothing she could hit me with that made a difference in that respect. So I was grateful for that, uh, having only men as sparring partners and men as who, especially men who were, you know, bigger and stronger and more experienced and, uh, and hit harder. <laughs> it was a good thing. Yeah. That's why I said, yeah. I mean, I experienced that myself too. It was, uh, when I was at Militich's camp, MFS, I used to spar with Tim Sovia, who was the UFC champ at the time, 6'8", 300 pounds, kind of 265. I shouldn't have been sparring him. Like, really, that was bad. I was only 202 pounds. Uh, and it probably did brain damage that I can never get back. But having said that, I mean, literally, uh, but having said that, when I went to pride tryouts in uh, Lions Den fighter, Tony Galindo hit me, who had knocked out all these guys in King of the Cage in like six seconds. When he hit me, boom, I'm like, oh, that's nothing. You know, and that that gives you so much confidence. And then I fought Sakuraba's prodigy underground fight for like an hour without knowing what's going on. He had he started, oh, he said light sparring. He had kicked me in the head full blast. But when I was used to guys like Tim Sylvia, Giants, Ben Rothwell, all these huge heavyweight fighters hitting me, um, is like I said, it's probably not good for the brain. Uh, but it, to a certain extent, you do get something of that because, uh, you know, you know the women you were fighting, some of them were very good, but like they didn't hit like you hit, and I'm sure they didn't hit like your your training partners. Hit. So it gives you this this confidence. It, it um, surely did. So I, I was grateful for that. What? Uh, so after this kind of exhibition that wasn't really an exhibition, where did you where did you go from there? Did you do more like martial art competitions before you got in like actual kickboxing, or what happened? No, actually, I went into amateur boxing for a little while because that was more popular in the area that I was I was doing martial arts. So um, I did a handful of, of uh, amateur boxing matches, um, and then okay. you know this while I was doing that, my my martial arts instructor slash coach um, was you know seeking out amateur kickboxing ma matches for me. So I was pretty decent at kicking, but. You know, everything was a – I had to learn everything on the fly as I was going. You know, I just hit the ground running and figured things out as I went. And every fight was like that. Um, every fight I've, I've had, they've always had more experience than me. My first pro fight uh, was against a girl who was 18 and 2, Pixie Elmore. And she was this uh, very crafty, and, and she knew a lot of dirty boxing, and she was really good at it. And I, I walk in as a, as a O and O as a pro. Um, I've only had like four or five, maybe six amateur fights, and then I turn pro. Um, so you know everything was always stacked against me every fight I went into, in that respect. Um, and you know I, I was just determined not to, not to quit. And we fought to a draw in that fight, and I remember an incredibly important lesson for my first pro fight in that. I think it was the second, maybe third round, and there was some water on the mat. The bell rang to start the fight, start that round, and I, there was water on the mat, and I was looking down trying to get that water off my foot because I didn't want to be slipping. And while I was looking down and getting that water off my foot, she ran across the ring and decked me as hard as she could and knocked me down, and I was furious. I was so freaking <laughs> angry. And I got up and ran to you know, and he, he gave me a standing eight count. I'm like, I heard how many good. Well, she knocked you down, so I have to give you a standing eight count. Oh, I was so mad. I was so mad at myself. And I I kept running in, I kept running back in face first, she knocked me down again. And I'd run in face first, she knocked me down again. And finally, after that round was over, my coach slapped me in the face and said, What are you doing? Stop running in face first. And <laughs> you know, I, I snapped out of it, right? And and then I watched her throw the next round started and I watched her throw this axe kick, you know, where you bring your leg around inside and you come down trying to hit them in the face. And I just shifted back while that foot came down and nailed her with the right hand. And I saw that it hurt her and I, you know, jumped on her and started hitting, but she was really good at hanging on and she pulled me into the ropes and made sure that I couldn't get out of it. And she was trying to recover, but you know, it, 
very smart, very, very smart fighter. And I learned um, not to fight angry ever because uh, anger doesn't necessarily make you better or help you fight harder or hit harder. Mm. It can cloud your judgment and it can definitely uh, uh, turn the blinders on to see what's going on. So I, that was an incredible lesson on that, my first pro fight. So you kind of tempered, you learned uh, over your career in those first few fights, you learned to kind of temper that fire so you could not anger, have the fire, but you could have better vision, see what's going on and see the punches coming and that kind of thing. Oh yeah. From that point on, I, I, I just set my emotions aside. I just put them in a little box over here. And, you know, in that respect, um, I, a lot of people ask if I did any kind of visualization or anything like that, is, you know, to see myself hand being raised and things like that. And, you know, it's a good, it's a good method of, of seeing yourself as a, as a champion or winning, but I never did that. Um, I was the kind of person who dealt with the, what was going on at that moment and moment to moment it was different. So I'm, I think one of the top 10, one of the top 10 attributes as a fighter is, is staying calm under pressure and being able to adapt. Um, and I, I, I think that's what I, I just really felt like in the moment, that's, that was my learning. Every time I had a fight, I learned something new about myself, especially. So, I mean, kickboxing is pretty intense. What did, what did people think about what you were doing? Like people around you or, or I, don't, I don't know, family or, or stuff like that. I mean, you're a very pretty lady to, to be going into kickboxing. People had to think you were a, a little bit nuts, <laughs> right? Or uh, what was what was what was that no. like? And that was, I mean, I don't know what you there was no were, doubt. were talking. I was fighting in the late '80s, early '90s, and at that okay. time, you know, women's kickboxing, uh, we didn't get paid as much, and we didn't have as much media coverage, and you know, uh, we weren't treated as well. And like, if you, when they set up the arena and they have the dressing rooms, you know, a lot of times they'd stick the girls in the girls' bathroom as opposed to having their own, our own, our own dressing room, our own, you know, warm up area. Um, and definitely weren't paid as well as the guys were at that time. But, you know, I, I made sure that every fight I had, I wanted to look as feminine as possible and fight just as well as the guys did. And that was my focus, to, you know, just to make sure that, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that promoters saw that there are women out there who will fight well and bring a lot of attention to their their card, you know, their their promotion. And it was a, it was a definite struggle. How uh, how many fights do you think you had? Uh, I guess pro fights before you finally started getting some like attention, media attention, people really took notice to you. Was there like one or two things where you're like, Oh, this is happening. Something's going on. You know what? Um, there's a promoter whose name is escaping me at the moment. Um, no, uh, Dennis Warner. Um, he actually saw my first pro fight and, you know, he didn't know that I was, Oh, no, as a pro I lied and said, I was six and zero, oh, and at that time there was no way to check the record, right? So, <laughs> you know, he didn't know. But he, what he did see was that these two women were uh, battling really, really fiercely, and he was really impressed with the fact that, you know, we had decent skill and uh, we were good. We were the the crowds were going crazy over over the fight. So in that respect, um, he asked me to, you know, to join his promotion and he promoted me more for fights. And then we started getting media coverage and um, I, it's not that like I was his sole fighter, but, you know, I definitely fought under on his cards a few times. And I think what made it good, uh, what helped a lot, especially was uh ESPN and pay-per-view events and Showtime and things like that, highlighting women in fighting. 
made a big difference because you know if you see the women fighting and they're doing a really good job and their, their skill level is high then that makes a big difference um, but it was definitely a struggle there were like many times um i'd go to gyms to fight to spar with other guys um and they'd look at me like oh there's a girl do i have to spar with her <laughs> yeah right yeah that's and i did that's, that's, with them yeah, that's yeah, always get a in difficult the ring with them situation. And it is. And I, I can tell by the look on their face, like, oh, crap, I have to spar with this girl. Well, I'm going to take it really easy. Or I'm going to try to beat her up so she doesn't do this anymore. And when that happened, I'd hit them absolutely as hard as I could. And I'd do everything I could to beat the crap out of them. I didn't care if I if I got some rough hits. I didn't care. It's like there's no way that they're going to walk out of that ring thinking, oh, okay. You know, I taught her a lesson. Uh-uh. There's no way that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And those those sparring matches were brutal. They were much harder than any fight I've had. Yeah, the spar hard, fight easy kind of thing. So I I think you were you were like five five fighting at like 125, and you were always in shape at walking weight. Was that your weight class or somewhere around there? That was my weight. That was my weight class, and I I stayed at that weight class 365. 365 days a year. I trained even on Christmas Day, Thanksgiving Day. didn't matter. I trained always. You were always, always. training, overtraining. So you were always in shape, just burning calories. Did you have to keep a strict diet or like you needed fuel because you were probably <laughs> training harder than everybody else? I had to train harder than everybody else. Um, my coach wouldn't let me do it otherwise. He just wouldn't let me. Mm -hmm. So he made me do more than he would make the guys do. Like we had a hell day, for example, that we do on Saturdays. And hell day was you go to a football field and you uh, warm up on the 440 laps. So you had to do five 440s absolutely as fast as you could. And the last one had to be within 10 seconds of the first lap you did. Otherwise, you had to do it all over again. And when you're done with that, then you had to run bleachers, run up, run across, run down, and you had to get a sparring partner on your back and run up bleachers with the sparring partner. And when you're done with that, you had to come back, come back down to the football field and run and run wind sprints. So, if you know what those are, go to the yeah. five yard, back to the zero, then to the ten, back to the zero, fifteen, back to the zero, and you had no rest. And when that was done, then you had to do duck walks across the entire football field. Ah, and we talk about cats. Go over there, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cats have a, like they know to hit keyboards and buttons so we got to try to avoid that yeah kitties, kitties always uh do that i think a, a cat last week they're just drawn and, uh, to it I the friends i was always is. at did that to me <laughs> um, <laughs> and here she but, is uh, hogging the camera girlfriend sit over here <laughs> she just wants some attention oh wow pretty cute face cute eyes uh, you know, at least this one has some hair Viking samurai. Oh, <laughs> yeah, excuse me, awesome sir. Yeah. I, I probably could have answered. That's uh, my best friend from high school. He'd probably be going crazy knowing that I got you on right now. Um, <laughs> so, how many. What, was there a first, like, really big event, a big fight that you had? Do you remember? Of course. What was the first, my like, first big win. one with a really huge my first crowd? World, and yeah. My first world title fight uh, in Las Vegas, it was at Caesar's Palace. And um, I got there 10 days beforehand, and they, uh, the promoter actually um, – created a parade of all the fighters going down the, the main strip in Las Vegas. And it, it was just an amazing promotion, amazing promotion. And, you know, this guy just, you know, loved throwing huge events and loved fighters and just loved doing all that. And that was, that was huge. And I had two broken ribs going into that fight. Um, I had, I was training with this guy uh, who was, 150, 145 pounds, but um, he was a new sparring partner because, you know, I always like to, to change sparring partners and, and keep myself sharp in that respect. So he threw a spinning back kick, hit me in the ribs right here, and they broke in the back. So the compression was so hard that two snapped in the back and they were fractured pretty good. Um, so 
they had open workouts so people could bet and you know decide who who's a favorite and who's not. And <laughs> I barely did anything during uh, during the warm ups and and open workouts. I just barely touched the bag and I shadow box and and no one could figure out whether or not you know I, they should bet for me or bet against me. <laughs> I had no idea, but. Las Vegas was a great, great, great place to fight. Um, so, I mean, that's just, it's just a wild life you were living. And then, so that first title fight, then boom, is this when like covers of magazines start happening after you win your first of five world titles? And then, I mean, I don't know, in, in boxing, was it Mia St. John at that time? So, and you were, the, yeah. you be, I don't know. Yeah, so she she was kind of becoming a sterling in boxing, and then boom, here you are, and now kickboxing, which means Black Belt Magazine, Kung Fu Illustrated, and all these stuff started happening, right? Yeah, they did. Um, I honestly can't remember when I was first offered to, um, to be featured in Black Belt Magazine. I don't know if it was during my career. I mean, yeah, obviously it was during my career, but I don't know if it was after my first world title fight or I'm not sure. Uh, it might've been a couple after that, but you know, I had, um, I had my second world title fight scheduled 30 days after my first one. Wow. And I already had broken ribs. So that was a challenge. Um, I remember after the fight, uh, I was in my, in my dressing room and the doctor has to come and check you out and make sure because in the state of Nevada, because both fights were in Nevada. Um, in the state of Nevada, you cannot have two world title fights within less than 45 days apart. And I had one scheduled 30 days apart, which meant that the doctor had to come and clear me in order to have that second world title fight. And that was up in Lake Tahoe. So I'm, I remember, you know, the, the adrenaline wore off and I'm just, you know, hugging myself and feeling horrible. And I said, look, keep an eye out for the doctor. If he comes in, let me know. So they see him walking up because we had trailers. They see him walking up like, hey, doctor's coming, doctor's coming. So he walks in the door and I sit up. And he goes, how are you feeling? I said, I feel great. <laughs> he goes, okay, let me see your hands. He looked at my hands and had a little bit of bruising from, you know, a couple of headbutts, accidental, but he checked my blood pressure, my heart and all that stuff. And he goes, well, okay, if you're feeling good, I think I'll go ahead and clear you for your next fight. I said, thanks, Doc. And he turned around and walked out and shut the door. And oh, I fell over. <laughs> <laughs> I was in so much pain. I, that's, I, that's crazy tenacity. I mean, woman, man, whatever, doesn't matter. To be beat up from a fight and now doing another one when he got broken ribs. It's just it's pretty insane, Kathy. <laughs> It's it really insane, is. but you never pass up an opportunity for a world title fight. You just don't. Yeah. You don't pass okay. it up. You don't say, "Oh, I'm sorry, my ribs are broken. Uh, can you can you wait?" No, they won't. They're not going to wait. They want to have that fight. They they want to have the promotion, and it's like you, you you either take it or you don't. And I wasn't going to pass it up. There's no way. Yeah. Well, I guess that's that mentality is why you were the five-time world champion and basically the queen of kickboxing. <laughs> um, we got, just so you know, we got people from all over the world. I'm seeing Russia. I think someone said uh, Austria or Australia. I forget which. Um, we got uh, Remy from Norway. We got people joining in. Um, so just want to, you know, that guys nice. are going to talk about her movie career um, and her boxing and MMA fights and all that. We'll get to it. So, uh, I'm glad everybody uh, is enjoying this so far. Um, and she will take questions at the end, so make your best questions. I don't want 10 shady ones. Give me your two best questions, everybody, uh, at the end. Keep it clean because we're, we're on YouTube and Spotify, and I don't even know where else uh, they're sending it out to in the podcast arena now. Um, but I'm going to be all over the place. So, um, I'm curious. I'm so, curious about something. What's that? What is your <laughs> What is your idea of a shady question? 
Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll get to you know Catwoman outfits and and and, and stranger oh, okay. stranger it. scenes and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I'm just I'm just Fair the enough. host. You can answer as you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I get it. Yeah. Um, so, how how did the second title fight go? The second title fight um, went really well. It was against a girl who I had fought as a professional. Um, you know, it was for the I fought her for I think the U.S. title or something like that. Um, but anyway, it was a girl I had I had fought before, so. Yeah. I knew that she was gunning for me and this was an opportunity for her to not only um, beat me because I had beaten her the first time we fought, but to also get that title. And uh, I knew that she'd been training. She was probably training like 10 times harder than she normally would just because, because it was me and she got really angry when she, when she didn't get that fight, when she didn't get the decision. And this was her chance to to not only beat me up but take that title that that we're both trying for. So um, it went really well. I like I said, I, my coaches were the ones that would study uh, my opponents, and you know they would tell me about it. But I'm a, I'm an at the moment kind of kind of fighter. You know, I deal with what's in front of me at the moment, and you know I figure them out. And as soon as I can figure them out, then you know I'll I'll try to exploit whatever weakness I see and go from there. Not to say that I don't have weaknesses that they can see, but, you know, everybody uh, has them. I think you kind of just touched on it. In, but I think what you did is different than everyone else. You realize they're going to be training even harder than before. They're going to have the hunger before. I think a lot of champions uh, in a rematch, if, if they won – it beat someone in, in previously coming up or whatever. I think a lot of champions get overconfident like a days ago, like, well, I beat them once I can beat them again. And, um, you know, it seems like a lot of people get complacent. So they don't do their conditioning as hard and, and things like that. But it sounds like you didn't fall into that trap. No, I didn't. And I know for a fact that, if you want to be a world champion, then you have to continually evolve and grow. You have to, because everybody is going to gunning for you. Once you have that world title, any world title, people are gunning for you. They want to take it away. And if you don't become the most well-rounded fighter you can possibly be, then you will, you will eventually take, be, have it taken from you um, unless you retire undefeated, which is uh, usually optimal, but, you know, it all depends on the person. So speaking of being well-rounded, because you brought it up, I mean, obviously it's sports-specific, kickboxing. But you had already a background of keto, Kung Fu Sansu, Wing Chun, JKD, uh, all, all this kind of stuff. Do you think being a true martial artist, having a well-rounded approach made you a better kickboxer? It sure did. Now, there's an interesting term that as a martial artist, you know, um, I'm a martial artist first, uh, as opposed to, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's me. I'm, I'm kickboxing is my sport. It's my thing. It's my life. It's, it's, you know, the way I live everything, but I'm a martial artist first and kickboxing was something, um, I, I happen to become very good at, but it's not my first love. You know what I mean? So as a martial artist, you learn how to learn and you learn how to apply what you've learned to everything that you do, everything, whether it's making your bed, cleaning your room, doing work, um, you know, the discipline, the self-discipline is really where it, it has the biggest effect because I know for a fact that anybody and everybody that I'm going to compete against during my kickboxing days, that everybody's, I looked at everybody as the, the, the toughest fighter in the world and I have to do everything I possibly can to beat them. They are absolutely the best fighter I've ever run across and I have to be really good in order to beat them. Even if I, I didn't know who they were, it didn't matter to me. What mattered to me was I just considered they were the best, the best fighter ever. And if I didn't train hard and do everything I possibly could do 
if I wasn't in the absolute best condition, I would get beaten. So that's the way I approached every single fight, whether it was a, even, even as a, as a beginning pro, I look at it that way, you know, and I didn't know nearly as much as I, I did, you know, several fights later, but every single fight I've learned and every sparring match I have, you know, especially with the guys who were far more experienced than me, I learned a lot. And I learned how to hit hard and I learned how, to, you know, good evasion and good footwork and all that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that, you know, I have to figure them out. And every person is different. Every fight's different. So you have to treat that just like, the, just like you would anything else. Because you can't do one thing. Like Bronco Sikatik, do you remember who he is? Yeah. Who he was? Yeah, K1 fighter. Okay. Right. Bronco had... I think a, a handful of combinations that he was extremely good at and he didn't vary from those combinations, but for a while until he got figured out, he was just steamrolling over everybody and winning and winning and winning because he was super tough and he had these super strong combinations. But once they figured that he not, he's not versatile and he cannot adapt, they figured him out and they beat him because he couldn't grow outside of what he was really good at. He stuck to the combinations that he knew. So and you he have to really adapt. And that, you have to. You have to adapt and overcome. Did you, did you usually feel girls out uh, kind of the first round? And, and, and put? did you increase your pressure second, third round? Did you look at trying to figure out and, and, and try different combinations while you were in there? Do you remember, like, thinking about that as you went on, like – all right, let's see if she deals with the jab in the front or let's put the round kick on the end. Like sometimes you were catching girls with left high kicks at the end of combinations and, and, and stuff like that. Are those the openings that you would sense? Yes. Um, I learned that if you look somebody in the eye, you're going to – if you expand your peripheral vision, you're going to miss their feet. You're going to miss the, the shift of weight as they're coming in to throw a, a right strike or a left strike. And what I would do instead is – um, you know, maintain enough of a distance if I could that if they're going to move forward, I'm going to see what's coming because by the shift of their weight, if they're right, if they're throwing a right anything, whether it's a right punch or uh, mm -hmm. a right kick or a right knee or a right elbow, it didn't matter. I would see that coming before it got to me and I would read their body language basically and understand and I'd watch for. You know, if, they, if they're throwing strikes, if they're bringing them back to here as opposed to here, big difference, right? And yeah, my corner was also yeah. really good at that as well. They'd say, hey, every time, like my first world title fight, I remember somebody helping in our corner, and he said, hey, Kat, do you know how to throw spinning backhands? I said, sure. He goes, she was southpaw, and she always carried her hand here as opposed to here. And he goes, I think you're going to nail her really hard if you throw that spinning backhand and, and uh, you're going to hit her right right, clean. And I, I did many, many times. I hit her clean with a spinning backhand because she carried her hand low. Um, so it's things like that. You know, I, I'm you know, an in-the-moment kind of fighter where, you know, my coaches, of course, were the kind of person to study if they could. They study their opponent. Yeah, I think awareness, I perception – no, it, it, it does. I mean, I, I, a lot of people tuning in are my YouTube followers, so they're pretty skilled martial artists in their in their own right. But being able to hear about mm -hmm. things like vision and awareness, even even guys like even guys in the UFC Bellator and stuff, uh, many of them are just bangers, but they don't have very good vision. And um, that's something that the champions in any combat sport have that even some tough guys don't have is very good vision to see what's coming in. And really it's an awareness of the weight shift and the shoulders and all the telegraphs guys flaring their elbows up and, and things like that. So uh, I like to hear about that. Uh, I, 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 th I think I tend to look just wide overall, but probably across the shoulders, uh, which I, it sounds like maybe you did too, a little more boxing focus. Whereas like some Muay Thai fighters, because of the point scoring system in Muay Thai is kicks and knees first. They tend to look down and that's changing, I think. And in, in Thailand, um, they've hired like Filipino boxing coaches and stuff. So actually the boxing in Muay Thai is finally starting to get better. 
Whereas, like you, you mentioned, Brocco Sketic, um, Dutch kickboxing focused more on the hands, kind of like Kyoko Shin boxing Muay Thai put together. Right. Um, right. So I think those guys tended to look higher because 88% or something in knockouts in K1 were from the hands, not from the kicks. I'm, I'm a great kicker myself starting in Taekwondo and uh, whatnot. But right. Right. did you, did, did you kind of just, do you think you, like you could go top triangle, bottom triangle, or just cross the shoulders? Is that, is that, did you focus on any one of those more than the others? No. Do you think? No, I don't think so. I think what I wanted to see is their entire sphere of influence. And one of the best ways to do that is to ma maintain a distance, enough of a distance that, you know, they have to step to reach you in mm. order to have any kind of, uh, to be able to strike at you. So, I mean, it's not that I would constantly stay just outside of their hands or kicking range, but because um, there were times when I would just, you know, blitz forward depending on who the fighter was and, and whether or not I felt that, that was a, a, a good thing to do because you have to learn how to fight inside, you have to learn how to fight outside, and you have to have superior footwork to be able to come in and out as you as you need to, right? So in that respect, if, if I was dealing with somebody who was an enclosed fighter who liked to be on you, like a Troy Dorsey kind of fighter, right? If I was dealing with somebody like that, then I would stay on the outside and, and try to pick on them that way. Um, because I know that they're they're comfortable inside, so I would purposely keep them on the outside because I know they're comfortable inside. Right. But I can find them as well. Kathy, the audio just so you know, the audio's suddenly gone kind of bad on your end. I don't know if the kitty's on the microphone or it's nope. just your connection to the internet. <clears throat> um, just make it sure nothing's just my connection. That's better now. You move the mic, I think, and it's better now. Okay. Yeah, it's much better now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Something might have covered it or hit it or something. Um, yeah, having a big uh, sphere influence. I like that. I like that term, the sphere influence. Uh, you had very good movement. I mean, I, people already in the comment section, kind of like uh, UFC champion Valentino Shevchenko. I th yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh-oh. Hmm. Hey, Dan, you're frozen. Okay, guys, I'm not sure. Sorry about that. We had some Wi-Fi technical difficulties. Uh, please stay tuned. I, I'm seeing that we're still live, so you guys got me. I just need Kathy to uh, click back in. I'm not sure. Sorry about that. We had some Wi-Fi technical difficulties. Please stay tuned. I'm seeing that we're still live, so you guys got me. Okay, I'm seeing myself, guys. 
So please stay tuned. Um, okay, guys, so I just need Kathy to join back in, which shouldn't be a problem. She'll be with us in one second. I hope you guys are enjoying it, guys. Please uh, let me plug my DVD while we're at it. Anyone who hasn't gotten yet, my four and a half hour combative and street jujitsu DVD on BJJ Fanatics. I think we'll get Kathy uh, coming back in in just a second. So let's hope for that. Uh, guys, if you got questions for me or for Kathy, uh, please uh, prepare them. Um, so you guys are hearing and seeing me fine, it looked like. I checked YouTube very quickly. It seems like you guys are hearing me fine, correct? Let me know in the comments. And um, and we should be getting Kathy back uh, in a second, unless it's a Wi-Fi problem on her part. Uh, I, I tend to think that it was actually mine, though her audio had gone out for a second. So don't go anywhere, guys. Give me like two minutes. In fact, let's watch a little video of Miss Kathy Long right now. I happen to do my research because I'm a very dedicated podcaster. I did my research, and after we're done talking about her kickboxing career, I'm going to talk boxing, MMA, and we'll talk about her movie career. So let me just plug this real fast. She was a beautiful woman with no past, no name, and no mercy. You got a smart mouth, bitch. My name's not bitch. In a town ruled by fear. Cat's brothers are dead. Totally mangled up. Never seen anything like it. She's fighting to avenge an unspeakable wrong. You got any idea what killed the cats? Curiosity. Standing alone against an army of evil. I'm talking to you. Bitch. You're the second man today to call me that. Well, that other fella must have been a good judge of character. Not anymore. The odds are murder, and that's just the way she likes it. You want to give us your side of the story? They messed with me. I killed them. Now, in an explosive quest for justice and revenge, she will become a warrior with no equal. When you look at me, I can't tell if you want to kill me or take me to bed. Do it. Oh, shit! Oh, let her get away! It's Stowe! She's here. Put her down! Now tell me who you are. Starring kickboxing champion Kathy Long, Eric Pierpont, and Ginger Lynn Allen. The Stranger. Lawman says you might be able to tell me where my friends are. They're all dead. What killed them? Bad manners. On video cassette now from Columbia TriStar Home Video. Uh, uh, text from Kathy. She's trying to join back in right now. Um, hold on one second, guys. We're going to see if we can get Kathy back. She's trying to click back on the link. I'm going to tell her to try one more time, and then I might have to exit out. Please don't leave us, guys. Uh, let me know your questions uh, in the comments right now, some questions you want me to ask Kathy, uh, and we'll just talk about it in a minute. Uh, guys, she commentated the first ever UFC. She fought two MMA fights, I think three or more boxing matches, uh, and then we're going to talk about her movie career. So please don't leave. This is the first time this has happened to me while podcasting. And um, we're just trying to get her back. She's trying to get back. I might have to get her a new link. I might have to exit out uh, for one second. And I'm not sure. This let us me join back in. Hopefully, uh, it will let her join back in uh, again. And I think she's having difficulty.
So, uh, guys, I'm asking her right now. Uh, guys, you just dropped off. Really? Come on, people. Just give it five minutes. Uh, you know, well, meanwhile, I can talk to you about some of your questions. Um, yeah, that was her movie, The Stranger, guys. It is on YouTube. I hooked it up to my TV, and I watched the full movie, The Stranger, which we'll be talking to her about. Oh, apparently there was a following out uh, with Bill Wallace. I didn't know that about female fighting. Um, so that's a good question. We'll ask her about that. I don't know if they just had a disagreement about whether females belonged uh, in the octagon or not. Uh, Kathy's still texting me, guys, so she can still hear me. I don't know if the same link to join in. It's like I join back in automatically. Uh, I don't know if she's able to use the same link. I might have, if she's going to try one more time, I might have to exit out. Uh, let me know some other questions. That's a good question. I'll have to try to remember that, Joby, about the Bill Wallace thing. Uh, Robert Nguyen's asking about questions about recently people breaking their legs while throwing kicks, getting checked by, you know, shins or elbows. Uh, like uh, Connor, it looks like Connor, I guess, posted a lot of pictures lately that he had previously already hurt his ankle, you know, always icing it and stuff before the fight. Okay, Kathy can't get back in with the same link. Uh, guys, please don't go anywhere. Um, let me please watch the trailer to my DVD really quick, and I'm going to try and work this out, see if I can exit out and back in. I don't know if we'll keep playing, uh, but it looks like it reconnected right away. So uh, watch the trailer to my DVD for a couple minutes. Hopefully that doesn't go out. I'm going to see if I can exit out and get her a new link. Fuck you, trust me. Back off, you back up. Hey, man, I want to come. What? What's up, bro? Hey, man, I want to come. I want to come. Come on, go on, bro. Boom! I don't want trouble. Problem, bro? What's up? Back off, dude. Back off. Ha! Boom, and I break it. Don't touch me, bro. It's time to leave. Get your hand off me. Oh, you want to play it rough, huh? Don't touch me. What the hell are you doing, man? Relax. Wrestling. Stop. Roll over. Give me your hands. Roll over. Give me your hands. Oh, back off, dude, back off, dude. Oh my god, 
ding it, ding it, ding it, ding it. The armor. Here. Oh, and now I slam. And now. And we're back, guys. Thank you for the <laughs> technical difficulties. So I don't know what happened. One of our Wi Fi's must have kicked out for a second. We did have an audio problem a second before. So it happens sometimes, guys. Um, first time it happened here. But thank you, Kathy, for bearing with us. And everyone did. Now, the few that left, hopefully you check back in because I think we're back on YouTube fine. You guys watched a couple videos. And we're back, correct? Is everyone back? We're back on YouTube. I can't have YouTube open because of audio feedback, guys. Um, so someone comment let, right now. Give me the yes, we're back on the same YouTube video. And uh, let, let let us know that we're cool. <laughs> Yay. <clears throat> Yay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kathy. So, You're welcome. All right. We're going through some of your fights. Before we leave the fighting subject, uh, I just want any stories about the third, fourth, and fifth title fight, if you have them. And I also want to know out of all the females uh, you fought, just kickboxing, or if you want to include boxing and MMA, uh, I want to know who was your toughest fight and why. So if you could kind of go in, a, you want to talk about your third title fight, do you remember – any specifics about your third, fourth, and fifth title fights? Absolutely. Um, my third world title fight, let me make sure I'm not just confusing the two. Yeah, I went to France, and I fought a girl named Danny Roca, and she had the WKA world title, and I was going to France to compete against her and take her title if, if I could. And... Whew, I got there 10 days before and I was treated so well. I have to say that, you know, there are some promoters who, you know, they, they'll bring in a, a fighter from another country and they won't give them enough time to acclimate. They won't, they'll make sure they don't get enough sleep. They'll make sure that um, they're screwing them over as best they can so that their fighter will win. But that was not the case here in, in France. So in that respect, I was so grateful to be treated so well and have all the sparring and training I needed. And um, I had plenty of time to acclimate. So but when I get there to the weigh-ins, <laughs> this is, we get there early in the morning and everybody else is weighing in and we're the main event. And traditionally um, when you go to France, you always present your opponent with a, a gift. So I gave her um, a UCLA sweatshirt which she is, Sarah, come on. 
which she absolutely adored. And um, we didn't know if she was southpaw, left-handed or right-handed. And she gave me these, these little pair of gloves. One had an American flag, one had a French flag. And so my coach says, hey, ask her to sign the gloves so we see you know, if she's left-handed or right-handed. <laughs> Because he cared, I didn't care. It's like I've I've fought southpaws before, and it's like okay, whatever. You know, I'm just gonna go for it, right? Yeah. And so she signs it with her right hand, and he sees that she's right-handed, and I'm like, oh, uh, he goes like, oh, okay, great, this is wonderful. And I I didn't care either way, but he did for whatever reason. And uh, <laughs> she signed the gloves. I am your punisher. And I thought, okay, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> She didn't ask me to sign her sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah. So that was because you were known as the right Punisher, there. the Princess of Pain, the Queen of Miss something, Queen of Mean, Mistress of Mayhem, blah blah blah. It went on and on. <laughs> oh, I, li I like the Mistress of Mayhem. <laughs> you can you can thank Jimmy Lennon Jr. for that. I don't know yeah. where he came up with those, but he just started <laughs> rattling them off one day. It was funny. <laughs> um, but anyway, when the weigh-ins started happening. Um, she was the champion, so she jumped on the scale first. We were supposed to weigh 124 pounds. She jumped on the scale. She weighed 140 pounds. Ooh. And then she quickly got off the scale. And I said, wait a minute. Hold on. Get back on that scale. And the promoter says, no, it's no problem. He's a, she's the world champion. You are the challenger. Do you want to go home? And I'm like, really? You're going to let her weigh 140 pounds? And I had no other option. It was either take the fight or go home empty-handed yeah. with no pay, nothing. And I thought, oh, hell no. We're fighting. Yeah. <laughs> and we get into the ring, and I remember the first couple of rounds sparring with her. She hit like a freaking mule. I mean, she was one of the hardest hitting people, uh, women, I'd ever, I'd ever come across. Come on, Sarah. It's good over, girl. Well, I mean, 15 pounds isn't a big deal from 225 to 240. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. But 125 right. to 140, that's a huge percentile difference. You know what? Uh, I was used to it, really, because all my sparring partners weighed more than I did, all of them. And they all hit harder, and they were all more experienced. And I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to treat her like one of my heavier sparring partners. So be it. It's okay. And – I remember um, when she was hitting me, I, I felt every bit of it. And not that I felt the pain, but it was like, damn, she hits hard. And I remember at one point she hit me with a right cross and I, my butt skidded on the freaking mat and the room is doing this. I felt like I was in the matrix and I just thought, crap, I'm out on my feet. This is not good. And I start getting up and the referee's running up to me and I said, do you get that water cleaned up off that mat? I'm slipping everywhere. This is the main event. There should be no water on that mat. There's no need for me to be slipping like this. And there was no water on the mat. I, I had to think of something because I was not about to get a standing eight count. Fuck that shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, did, did, was this prepped in advance in case that ever happened? Or did you just. Oh, hell no. It? it was. I, I had to think of something. I had to think of any way not to get a San Diego count. It's like, no, I can't get a San Diego count. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so he goes, okay, just a slip, no problem. And he gets up and he's wiping off water that's not there. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, I had about, I don't know, 40, 50 seconds left of the round. And I was doing everything I could to keep away from her because <laughs> I was still not recovered yet. She hit me that hard, and I just thought, damn, I got to figure this girl out, right? So I sat down in the corner, and my, my coach says, oh, she rang your bell, didn't she? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she did. And in my mind, I kept thinking, there has to be a chink in her armor somewhere. Has to be. There has to be some weakness somewhere, because up until that point, I had been, before her fight, before my fight with her, I had been studying Mike Tyson. And, you know, watching how he would do that quick little bottom, boom, monster hook. Mm -hmm. And following up with that, and I, I tried it, and I tried it, and I hit her as hard as I freaking could. And she just looked at me like, yeah, so. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I thought, crap, what am I going to do? <laughs> so 
I tried, I was trying everything I could think of, you know, to find that chink to, to make her wince in pain at least. And I, it came when I kicked her in the shin with my shin. I kicked her as hard as I could. And I saw her wince in pain. And I thought, that's it. I found it. I found that chink. So I kick her in the shin, follow with the hook, kick her in the shin, follow with the hook. And then I'd kick her the other way in the shin, follow with her overhand right. And I just kept hitting her over and over and over, hoping that it made a difference. Now, do you mean and like a, a, a do you mean like a calf kick, like a round kick to her the side no, of her I shin? A calf kick, shin. or do you mean like a, a stomp with the bottom of your foot, like an oblique kick to her the front no, of the shin? I would just defense. roundhouse kick her in the shin as hard as I could. Okay. As hard as I could. Because I saw that tiny little winds of pain, and I just thought, that's it. Because I'm one of those fighters that doesn't feel any pain during the fight. You know, I broke my hand when I was fighting on Showtime, and I felt a tiny little twinge. And I knew it was broken, but I figured, well, I don't feel any pain, so I'm just going to keep hitting her, right? So I'm one of those fighters that has so much adrenaline pumping through me, and I don't feel pain. And I just thought, all right, screw it. <laughs> I'm going for broke, whatever it takes. <laughs> so I was just kicking her in the shins as hard as I could with my own shins, right? And uh, ended up breaking her jaw. Um, I had no idea it was broken, and I closed her left eye shut, and – her shins were hurting like crazy. And, you know, I ended up fracturing my own shin on hers. Um, yeah. But um, I figured her out and I got her. And I, I took that title. And she was one of definitely one of the toughest fights I've ever had. So did that one go to the decision in France and you got the hometown decision? Yes, I did. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Shocking. I, to... I had no idea. <laughs> I need I need to watch that one. That sounds very epic. Considering the weight difference and hometown, guys, if you, you can you, find you don't, it, you don't win a championship title by decision typically in combat sports uh, in someone else's country. That just it just doesn't happen. So that one had to feel especially good. I'm sure it felt amazing, and you know I I I, I was. I was really blown away because I figured that I, I lost that fight because I didn't knock her out. And I knew, you know, you're going to somebody's hometown. There's just no way you're going to win that fight unless you win it so convincingly or you knock them out. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. And for whatever reason, they felt that I took the fight. So I know the first few rounds were hers because she hit like a freaking mule and I was trying to figure her out. And it, yeah. it took a minute. <laughs> it took a few minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you talked about being a true martial artist and you switched to like Mike Tyson style, leaping three, two type stuff that Mike was able to use on taller opponents. And right. you figured out kicking her in the shins actually got, got a wince of pain from her, which probably opened up her, her head and everything eventually. So, um, you know, being able to adapt flow like water, my friend, like, uh, yeah, that's, that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty amazing. That sounds that sounds very uh, epic. So uh, you got your money, you got your win money. Did you get to enjoy France a little bit before you flew back home? Absolutely, I did. Got to got to tour a little bit and have some fun. And um, I didn't speak French, which is unfortunate. But I've been to France. I've been back to France several times, and I, you know, definitely learned some French so that I could, you know, actually enjoy the experience more. But um, we did get to do some sightseeing and it was fun. I, I really enjoyed it and I was very happy to be there. And, and that was one of my better experiences. Um, yeah, it was good. Um, it was, it was a tough experience, but it was really a good experience. I think yeah. honestly, my first pro fight, um, I, I take that back. One of my first pro fights in, uh, I went to England and I fought Lisa Howarth and I get there and Master Toddy is is the promoter, and I get there and and uh, he threw me in Manchester. The fight was in London and I was in Manchester, basically training by myself because my coach went back to the states for some quote unquote emergency. Who knows what that was? But um, I remember just being completely alone in an area where it was in very industrial like, and I had no there was really no gym to train in. There was no heavy bag to hit. There was, you know, I just did running and shadow boxing and whatever I could do to, you know, acclimate to the time frame. And then 
the day before the fight, they they put us on a bus and we went and stayed overnight in some hotel room that was no bigger than a bathroom <laughs> with a tiny little cot about this wide, <laughs> dead serious, and bathroom down the hall, right? And then I get there and they change the rules to full Muay Thai. And I, I was unfamiliar with Muay Thai. I, I knew about knees and clinching, and, but I hadn't really practiced it because I was early in my pro career. And Lisa Howarth just wiped the floor with me. Just at that point, she was just, you know, winning easily. And I, I completely lost that fight. But I learned something really important. And I made a decision at that at that moment because after the fight, you know, I just figured, all right, I accepted the fight under the rules that I was unfamiliar with, and so be it. I, I took that fight, and I wasn't going to be a pussy American and go home. Sorry, I just wasn't going to do that. So I fought her, and I lost, and I thought, all right. So at some point, I figured in my mind, if you go to another country, you need to have some sort of liaison who will – be your advocate for you and and make sure that you're not being treated disrespectfully or um unjustly right um so that was my first time going out of the country to fight and i'm bringing this up because it was early in my pro career and it was a very tough fight i didn't get hurt at all but she just schooled me totally schooled me and rightfully so i didn't understand the rules Mo mostly in the clinch right or the fact that she could flow through the ranges Always giving you problems. Close to the ranges in the clinch, and I didn't understand the clinch as well as I could have. I mean, I had been, I started, you know, getting familiar with Muay Thai, but I really didn't know much about it at all. And so she was clearly um, winning the fight with clinches and knees, especially that. And, you know, I didn't know how to, to get out, I didn't know how to swim in. And, and I do now, of course, and I've fought Muay Thai since, but mm -hmm. at that time, um, it, was a good, it was a good education. She beat the snot out of me. Didn't hurt me at all, but, you know, clearly, clearly won, clearly. And the defining factor was after the fight, they announced her the winner, and I shook my head and thought, okay, that was a good learning experience. You know, I understand what that's like now. And my trainer slash boyfriend slash coach, he started screaming and yelling at me and humiliating me in front of close to 40,000 people. And you could hear a pin drop because his language was so foul and his his intent toward me was so vicious and mean that it just took everybody by surprise. And I was looking at him while he's screaming and yelling at me. And I thought to myself, well, if this is what it means to lose, I'm never going to lose again. And I made up my mind never to lose a fight again, period. And I didn't. Yeah. At that point, yes. I did absolutely everything I could possibly do to make sure that I won that fight. If it meant that I had to outsmart them, outfinesse them, outstrength them, uh, have better footwork, better tactics, didn't matter what it was. I made damn sure I didn't lose that next fight or any fight after that. It's a good learning experience. I'm glad it yeah. happened in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, nowadays people are so weak they would never think of something like that as a uh, learning experience. And just so you know, we got people joining in from all over the world. Big, big uh, martial arts YouTube channels uh, like Remy, uh, an Aikido instructor, martial arts one on one in Norway. Uh, we got Viking Samurai does 80s, 90s action movies, really cool stuff. I've been on his channel about. Uh, five, six times now. Uh, we got stuntman nice. from Thailand, Ron Smornberg. Uh, Ron has fought everyone from Jackie Chan to Steven Seagal, Scott Atkins, Michael J. J. White in movies. Um, you know, and, and here's someone nice. that made That's his awesome. life off of martial arts now, but talking about being young and seeing you on the cover of Kung, Kung Fu magazines and stuff. So you've influenced a lot of people <laughs> that are tuning in uh, right now that are, that, you know, that are good martial artists in their own right. Um, so I just wanted you to know that everyone seems to be enjoying this. Um, uh, what about your fourth and your fifth title fights? Do you got any stories about that? <clears throat> yeah. Um, my fourth title fight, I was fighting in, um, I'm trying to remember Harris. No, was it Harris Tahoe? 
it was in Vegas, uh, not Vegas, but in, in Nevada. And it was against a girl named Ramona Gato who lived in Northern California. And this was for a vacant title. So she didn't have it. I didn't have it. It was a vacant title. We were both, you know, the top 10 in our, our divisions and um, we were both offered the fight. So I trained like I normally do, trained my ass off. And I was only allowed to take a week off after a fight. Uh, after that, from that point on, you know, that one week is all I got after a fight. And then it was right back to training because I decided that as a professional, if that is my profession, I can't take, you know, a few months off or five months off or six months off and just train when I find a good fight. Because at that time, if a promoter called and wanted you to fight, you didn't turn it down. You took it. You took it because that's your job, Right. So in that respect, um, before the fight, I got really, really sick, really sick. And it was too close to the fight. Um, I mean, I, I, I probably should have said, you know, I, I can't take this fight because I'm way too sick. But I took it anyway. I mean, I, I had it. It was scheduled months before, but right before the fight, I got sick. And... It had happened once before or later when I went into boxing, but um, for this particular fight, it was against Ramona Gato, and I remember in that fight just feeling miserable, absolutely miserable, and I did, had no clue what I was doing <laughs> in the fight because I just felt horrible, and I remember there were times when I felt like she was just on me, like like white on rice. <laughs> she was just on me and wouldn't let up. And I, I, in my mind, I'm fighting as, as best I can, but I just didn't feel like I had the strength or the stamina or the speed or anything. And, you know, and, and I'm thinking to myself, all right, so your, your body is still in good shape, Kat. So it, it'll respond to what you tell it to do. So tell it to do that. Tell it to fight. <laughs> so that's the interesting thoughts that are going through my mind. It's like, okay, in my mind, I'm thinking I feel horrible, but my body will still be able to respond to what I tell it to do because that's the way the mind works, right? The mind is the queen bee and, and all the worker bees, which is your body, does what it tells what your mind tells it to do, right? And that's the truth. <laughs> that's why you can, well, we'll go on later with that, but that's why you can uh, decide not to be sick or decide not to have this or decide not to have that. And, you know, if your mind is strong enough, your body will listen. Right. So I just decided, all right, no matter what's going on, I'm just going to continue with this fight. Even though I was frustrated with her and had a, had a really rough time. And I remember um, Cecil Peoples was refing that I was the referee for that fight. And at one point I, I was telling him, get her off me. Because, you know, there was no clinching allowed in that particular set of rules. And I felt like she was just clinching all the time. And I kept saying, get her off me. He goes, you get her off her. You're the one that's fighting. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> Cracked me up. Your, your self-talk? <laughs> yeah, the self-talk. And I said it out loud. Get her off me, right? Because, you know, I felt like she was clinching so much. And, and Cecil's like, you get her off her. You're the one fighting her. <laughs> It's like, well, okay. Um, and I, I think the funniest part about that whole fight was at the very end when they're standing, we're standing there getting ready to hear who's going to win the fight because it lasted the distance. And I heard the, ref the, the announcer say, and new ISKA Bantamweight world champion or featherweight, I don't remember which it was. And before he announced the name, before he said the name, Ramona Gato started jumping up and screaming and yelling and going, I won. I beat the queen. I beat the queen. I took her title. And I looked at her and thought, this is a vacant title, silly. What are you <laughs> doing? Right? And then they said my name. And, oh, my God, was she furious. She was so angry, and I was like, "Yay! Thank God!" Because I could, I couldn't figure out if I'd won or lost. I figured I'd lost, you know, because I felt miserable, and you know, I had all this self-talk going on. And while the self-talk's going on, I'm still trying to fight her, right? Yeah. And I'm just thinking, I, I thought I had lost the fight, but when they announced my name, totally shocked, totally shocked. And 
and totally elated. <laughs> and uh, watching the way she was responding, I mean, she was just so angry. You know I won that fight. You took that. That's bullshit. All the, all the judges know I won that fight. And I said, I don't know. I think the judges decided I won that fight. <laughs> Maybe you should talk to them. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then afterwards, she, you know, I, I, she would go to people and just tell them, you know, she, there's no way she won that fight. And she was a really bad sport about it. And it was unfortunate because I would have given her a rematch when I wasn't sick. I would have. But she had such a foul attitude and foul mouth. I just thought, nope, sorry. I'm never giving you an opportunity to, to, to get it back. Sorry. Done. Yeah. yeah. Wipe my hands of you. Go. Wow. <laughs> right? That's uh, that's pretty wild. I, I, I used to get sick before fights because, guys, your immune system's like crazy on, on fire, like when you're pushing yourself hard. And I got – I, I fought once sick against Yuki Kondo, the pancreas champion in Japan, and the media knew I was sick, and everyone knew I was sick, and I said, but I'm like a wounded samurai. I'm going to go after this guy. Now, he had like 60 yep. pro fights already at the time, and I was on my, I think, fifth. Um, <laughs> so, you know, oh, but it was very exciting. Unfortunately, mine didn't ha end up happy. I didn't end up winning, <laughs> but uh, but I did take it to him, and it was exciting. And I got his respect and the respect of the Japanese media because I'm like, Good. hey, look, Good. I'm I'm tired, so I'm just gonna go right at the guy, pretend I'm a samurai with my arm chopped off, and I'm just, you know, I, I just have to <laughs> yep. go right at him. And they like my responses, so. Uh, but yeah, being like flu-like and out of it and you're dizzy and your head can't quite think and you're registering stuff a second late, like, oh, I just got hit. Like, it's it's not the best feeling. But I guess you went through it and that's why you were a five-time world champion. And I'm just a guy with a YouTube channel. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Who has, uh, who has these, tons these of are great stories. I want, I want to get to so much more, but... You got any stories about your your fifth title fight before we talk about boxing, MMA, and movie career and all that? Yeah, because I mean sure. these are such big events, uh, world title fights. Uh, before we go there, at this point now, you're world famous. I mean, really, you were on the cover of every friggin' magazine there was. You were really one of the first uh, pioneers in in woman combat sports. What was it like? How did you deal with all that fame? Did you like it? Did you shy away from it? Um, was sometimes you know, the attention good and sometimes not good? Do you want to address that? I think that's a hard one because I was uh, I, I I've always been very shy, um, and I I learned over the years how to open up and speak to people. But you know, my initial and always my initial response is more toward shyness and I in that respect I know that people are saying I'm a, I'm a world champion and at that time during my career you know there was if you're a world champion then no one in that weight class is better than you right but I always felt like there was more to learn and I never felt like um, not that I didn't deserve it but it was just one of those situations where um, yeah, I got that media coverage and I got the title and I still have a crap load of things to learn. So I never really felt like I was at the top of my game um, because I always felt that there was more to learn. And, you know, I was grateful uh, for the media coverage, but I just, you know, I'm no better than anybody else. I put my pants on just like you do. Mm -hmm. um, so in that respect, uh I always remembered where I came from in my humble beginnings and not that I've ever made a, an absolute ton of money and, you know, I'm not living in a mansion or anything like that, but um, I was never really allowed an opportunity to just appreciate the fact that I won world titles when I was training. Cause it was always, you need to improve on this. You need to improve on this. You need to improve on this. And there's more you have to do. And it was, it was just a continual upward upward learning experience and or battle, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, upward battle. But um, I never shied away from it because 
you know, I did want to continue to grow and evolve as a martial artist, as a, as a, um, as a fighter in that respect. And, you know, I, I always applied my Kung Fu to as much as I could to everything that I did, you know, and, and applying your Kung Fu is applying yourself, you know, who you are. Um, if you break down the word Kung Fu, it's, it's your profession, your professional man, basically is what Kung Fu means. Right. Speaking of Kung person. Fu, before you go to your fifth title fight, you mentioned the spinning back fist earlier. That is something you used quite a bit. Is that something you first learned from, from the Kung Fu Sensu? Because you were good with that right spinning back fist quite a bit. Yeah, I, I, I knew how to do it, but I it wasn't from Kung Fu Sensu. It was just that I knew how to do one. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny. I, I never really thought about that in, in the sport of kickboxing or boxing or anything like that. I mean, you can't do that in boxing, but um, it was just something that I, I happened to know how to do. And and the, the guy helping in the corner just said, hey, do you know how to do a spinning backhand? I said, sure. <laughs> so, so I just did it. I knew how to do a spinning <laughs> back kick too and how to set it up and but it was not something that I did specifically for kickboxing. It's just something yeah. I knew how to do. It was just a, an, another tool that I added to my toolbox, right? Yes. Nice. Um, nice. Which is super important. And, you know, in that respect, I, the bigger your toolbox, the more tools you need to put in it. So you, you need to have the toolbox as big as, as, big as Chicago, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, you, and you touched on that, and I mean, you kept learning, and eventually I drove you to try boxing and MMA I, I, as well. So let's let's go to the fifth title fight and then discuss those, uh, and then we'll go on to, to, to movies and what you're up to nowadays and training and being a trainer and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, my fifth world title fight was against a girl named Kyoko Kamikaze. Uh, she's from Japan, so they brought her from Japan to come. And she was a shoot fighting competitor, and, and apparently a really good one. Um, contractually, we were uh, she we was quite to a send bit each tall. other. She was taller than you too, right? She no. Was pretty, no. No? No, she was about an inch shorter. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've, watched, I've watched some highlights of that fight. The whole fight is on YouTube if you ever want to see it. Okay. Um, but uh, as per our contract, we had to send each other uh, three fights, three previous fights, so that we could study each other. And this is the only time that I actually decided to go ahead and watch the mm -hmm. uh, her previous fights. And holy crap. When I watch them, I see this little Tasmanian devil named Kyoko Kamikaze, who is just this whirlwind of punches and kicks in five-minute rounds. And nonstop punching, kicking, punching, kicking, punching, kicking to the tune of each and every fight that she sent me, the girl would never answer the second round. They would say, I quit. Mm -hmm. And I thought, holy crap, <laughs> I do have the Tasmanian devil on my hands. So I trained like a freaking monster for that fight. And fortunately, I didn't have any injuries. I wasn't sick, nothing. Everything that I did was perfect all my training was perfect and i trained super hard with the hardest sparring partners i could find people who had you know i i felt better conditioning than me and so i really did everything i could to make sure my conditioning was pristine and i walked into that fight for the first time in my entire fighting career i was at 100 percent, first time ever and i thought yeah this is it this is perfect okay and we go to the weigh-ins, and I strip down to a bikini, and I'm flexing and smiling and goofing off and playing and having fun. And I stepped on the scale, exactly 124 pounds. And she comes onto the scale wearing T-shirt and shorts, also weighing 124 pounds. And we were at, you know, both of us were perfect weight and true professionals in that respect because I've never understood why, as a professional fighter, you have to come in at, you know, three or four or five pounds overweight. I've never understood why you did if that. If that's your freaking job, you come in at the weight you agree to come yeah. in at, right? Ah, that's a pet peeve with me. <laughs> but I was at weight 24 seven, 365 days a year. I never varied from that. Never. I was always at weight. I never had to cut weight. 
I didn't understand the whole concept of cutting weight. And that's, it's the wrestling community that actually brought that concept in, yeah. which is really unfortunate because they wanted to fight at the lightest weight possible. So they would do severe things to cut weight, which is not healthy. Oh, yeah. And everybody who does that, they don't realize that that's going to wreak havoc on them when they turn 40 and 50 and 60. Oh, yeah. The damage to the go, kidneys. I mean, there's been about nine deaths now, I think, in MMA. And most of them have been from uh, extreme weight, weight cutting. Yeah. 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 So and You don't need to cut weight. You just fight at the weight that's natural for you. And make sure you're in damn good shape and fight at that weight. But uh, I'll tell you this, while I was fighting in my kickboxing career, I was also running our gym. So I'd, I'd teach um, morning classes. I'd go wait tables uh, at lunchtime, get off from that, you know, run home 10 miles, and then teach evening classes. And then on Thursday and Friday and Saturday nights, I would go to the bar for, of the restaurant that I worked in, and I would bounce in that bar from nine at night until three in the morning. So those three nights, you know, I didn't get much sleep, but during that whole time, I mean, this is what was going on in my career. You know, I, I teach classes and work, wait tables, work as a bouncer three nights a week. And I ate maybe once a day if I was lucky because I just didn't have time. And I got used to uh, training when I was hungry and I got used to enjoying that feeling of being hungry because that kept my mind alert. It kept my, I, I was very sharp and I performed better without food. And it became a point where, you know, even if I didn't eat that one day, once in that day, I'd be okay because I was yeah. used to not having food, not that it was healthy and I didn't drink as much water either. Um, Although we were in Bakersfield, which is central California, mostly desert, we would get, you know, se severe heat pretty much nine months out of the year and, and then extreme cold for a few months out of the year, mm -hmm. which was, wasn't healthy either. But anyway, long story short, <laughs> I ate maybe once a day and I trained like a freaking maniac. And that's probably why I was able to maintain weight 365 days a year. Well, so I, mean, I digress. One, one meal a day, Omar's coming to fad i did it for a little while and i've been now most days i do a 16 8 split so yeah uh, yeah there's uh, yeah. nothing wrong with that go intermittent fasting in that respect um you know it's not unhealthy as long as what you're eating is good and healthy that, that makes a difference but you know at that time um i didn't think twice of it so getting ready for that fight by the way back to the, my fifth world title fight when I saw that she was, you know, just demolishing her opponents and that they so much so that they wouldn't answer the second round, they would just say, I quit. Literally, I just thought, oh, my God, I've got a tough fight on my hands. So I chose the toughest sparring partners I could find and trained my ass off. Going into that fight, we did the weigh-ins. And what I did not realize until after the fight was that when she saw me at the weigh-in, she freaked out she immediately was defeated in her mind that mm -hmm. she saw my physique. I mean, which, you were you know, very athletic, ripped, muscular. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. you were not the most common sight. Well, that's just what my body did naturally. And thank God, um, you know, but when she saw me, she, she was already defeated in her mind before we even got to the fight. So, here I am expecting the Tasmanian devil to run at me when the bell rings. And when she didn't, I had to really adjust. I had to make some severe adjustments in my mind and in my fight game. Uh, then I had to go on the hunt and, you know, go after her as much as I could. And, and I'm really not that type, type of a fighter. Um, I can be, but it's not something that, you know, I, I did naturally. I was more of a feel them out first round and then, you know, see what their, their weaknesses were um, and then go from there. But in this case, I had to, I had to be a heat seeking missile because she wasn't ready. She wasn't willing to come toward me and engage. So I had to go after her. And there were times when I was hitting her and I, I actually felt bad and I, I didn't, I just didn't feel it was fair. Um, and I knew that she was a really tough opponent, but 
in her mind, she was just already afraid of me and, yeah. and had already, you know, defeated. She was already defeated in her mind. And that was really unfortunate. But um, when she asked me, because at the end of the fight, uh, I remember the first time I knocked her down uh, with a hook. I was surprised by that because I, I didn't expect that to happen. She'd been staying up really well and I'd been attacking her like crazy. And when she fell down, I thought to myself, okay, stay down, just stay down, just stay down. <laughs> Cause I didn't want to hit her anymore. And then I, you know, I have constant pressure from my coach saying, you got to take her out. You got to take her out. You got to take her out. You got to knock her down, knock her out, knock her out. And I'm looking at him like, you know, you're not fighting. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. You know, I'm seeing a person who, you know, was scared to begin with, but who's also a really good fighter. And I, I wanted that fight. I wanted to be challenged by somebody who was really good. And I was expecting, you know, a good, serious, equal battle. That's what I was expecting. And that's what I was hoping for. Because I felt like finally I was I'm at the top of my game. You know, finally, I'm, I'm at my peak condition and I, I had no injuries and, you know, I was ready for a severe battle. And I, that's what I wanted. And and then when I, I, I would see the look on her face sometimes when I'd hit her repeatedly and I just thought I felt really bad. It was a very interesting, uh, <clears throat> very interesting take on on fighting in that respect, because mm. you're supposed to when you see blood, you're supposed to go in for the kill. And I, I couldn't bring myself to do that. It, it doesn't look like that in the fight, but that's because I was constantly being pressured by my coach to finish her. And when I, but you could sense the that they time, were, you could sense that she was already defeated, so you didn't want to. You like you felt like I didn't you, want to. You know, you it's not about merciful. hurting her. I just, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, prove that I was a better fighter that day. I didn't want to hurt her. And there were times when I, I I'd see the. I'd see the pain in her face and I'd back off and let her recover. And I know, you, uh, you know a lot of people don't agree with that, but did, you know, did you ever get a, a chance to talk to her afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I did. And we had agreed that she would uh, take a year to train and come back and fight me again. <clears throat> and I was happy to do that because she was such a good person mm -hmm. and you know, the, very respectful, very, very respectful as you know, that a lot of Japanese culture is. And the last thing I wanted to do was to be disrespectful to her. And, you know, I, I wanted somebody, I wanted her to come back a year later with more training and understanding, you know, how to deal with me in that fight. And it's like, yeah, bring it. Let's go. I'm happy for it, but we never got, we never got to fight again, mm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, but that that's interesting, you, you know, you bring up that side of that side of things and there you were at the top of your game. So you could probably feel that, no, I'm here and this person, maybe she mentally broke before she even got in the ring and you out tornadoed the tornado, if you will, you know, <laughs> yeah. and so you let her know right away. No, I'm, I'm here and. I, I'm I'm ready to whirlwind on you just as much as you've done everybody else, and so I think that's an interesting. Um, I I think you have to be at a high level as a martial artist to kind of sense the other person's power meter, if you will, to sense if they're in it, um, to sense if you're two steps above them, uh, and stuff like yeah. that. So I think that's yeah. that's very interesting. So now five world titles. Um, did he, did he keep kickboxing? And I think the records, like some places got you at 18 and one, but really you had a lot more. You had like 30 kickboxing matches probably because you had some of those. I, all, overall, with, if you want to combine my record, I've had close to 40 fights uh, with boxing, MMA, Muay Thai, and kickboxing. So um, 40 and two, 40, 40 something and two, let's put it that way. Um, okay. If you even want to combine them all. Now, at what point did you decide you wanted to, to go dabble in the boxing arena, like professionally? Well, I when I when I stopped kickboxing, it was because I was offered a film, um, which I you know I really didn't I didn't want to do it because I didn't know anything about acting and I I was super still really shy, but uh, 
the director was able to talk me into it and talk me into doing a reading with the producer. But what I didn't know is at the same time, he's trying to convince the producer that I would be good for the film. He was the only one that believed in me. Neither did the promoter, the producer didn't believe in me and I didn't believe in me. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to act. That's okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, so anyway, what film, long story what film was this? Uh, that was called Nights, spelled with a K, K-N-I-G-H-T-S. Okay. And that was with Chris Christopherson and Lance Henriksen. Oh, wow. Great guys. I've been on set with yeah. uh, Chris Christopherson once and uh, my friend who's yeah. been on the podcast, my first podcast with a guest, um, George Pagasich was with Lance Henriksen, who I, I just I just love. He killed it in um, Hard Target. Talked uh, Viking Samurai, one of our viewers now, yep. has talked a lot about him, and he killed it in Near Dark, my favorite vampire flick of all time, probably. Um, so that's that's pretty amazing. So what was that experience like doing your first film and also working with two really established, like, real actors? Well, I had a blast. It was just tons of fun. It was obviously a low-budget film. Uh, went straight to video, which is fine. But um, I just liked the experience of of, uh, of play acting and being on the set and being able to be creative. And it was a blast working. I mean, you you walk by um, Chris Christopherson's trailer and you would get a contact high because <laughs> he's constantly, you know, smoking weed and having a blast. And, you know, it was just a ton of fun working on that film. And then, um, you know, I got off. Maybe that's why his airplane guys. vanished and he got taken away by aliens. <laughs> I forget what, I forget what movie that Maybe. was. It was a very good know. movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, but working on, working on Batman returns was, was, you know, an absolute incredible experience. And that really is my first experience working on films of any kind okay. was, was Batman returns. Yeah. But, Long story how did short. you get the? How did you get the? Um, so night, I, I got to watch nights now. I got to, I got to look over your whole filmography. I only had a chance to uh, watch The Stranger the other night. So, um, did you have scenes with Lance Henriksen? What was he like before he would go on? Beautiful, and he's, he's a pretty intense dude. Very, very intense, but very fun, loving. Um, the kind of guy that, you know, would take it seriously when it was needed to be serious. And then, you know, he could let loose and, and enjoy and laugh and have fun and play. So um, okay. super good guy. Very professional. Yeah. I mean, aliens. I mean, that's just like, yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> how did you get the uh, gig um, for Batman Returns? Did a stunt coordinator decide you'd be a, a great double? Or how, how did that come in? No. Into? Not at all. Um, you know who Benny the Jet Yukitas is? Yeah, I've trained with Sensei Benny right. okay. a few times. We'll right. have to see if he wants to come on a podcast in the future. He will. He'll come on. Um, okay. Well, I had I was friends with him, and I you know, I had fought several of his girls, and and um, he called me out of the blue and said, "I worked on the first Batman." Um, and they're looking, I'm, I'm now, my whole stunt team is now going to work on the second Batman, which is Batman Returns. And this had um, Michael Keaton, Michelle Pfeiffer, Danny DeVito, <clears throat> and a few other people. But uh, he said, they're looking for a, a fight double for Michelle Pfeiffer. And I really think that you should apply. So I, I went ahead and called the stunt coordinator, uh, Max Clevins. I called him and I set up an appointment for you to meet him. And I think you should apply for it. And I said, okay, sure. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And all I had was a VHS tape of one of my fights because I, I didn't have a demo reel or anything like that. It wasn't all fancy. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, just had a tape of one of my fights. And I remember going into Warner Brothers and they gave me uh, a little map and instructions on how to get to this building. And it was a you know two-story building. I had to go upstairs. And so I'm, I'm walking around Warner Brothers trying to find this building, right? And I see this, uh, I see this young man who's uh, 
straggly hair and, and a, you know, a wife beater tank top and he had a button up shirt with skulls on it. And I said, excuse me, sir, do you happen to know where this building might be? And he goes, oh, sure. I know exactly where that is. And he led me over to the building and he goes, what are you here for? And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to audition for, as a fight double for Michelle Pfeiffer. He goes, oh, okay, well, good luck. You know, as Catwoman. And he goes, okay, good luck. And he showed me where the building was and I went upstairs and I walked in to the office and Max Clevens, and this is while I was still fighting, so I was shredded, 124 pounds, and yeah. and uh, wearing a you know tank top and shorts. And I walked in, and Max goes, "Oh my God, not another fat chick! Just just go lift some weights or something, and come back and see me later." And I, I laughed just like you did. And I said, "Oh, okay. You mean the Oreos I've been eating are finally showing?" <laughs> so. We goofed off a little bit and talked, and he goes, what do you got, kid? And I said, well, I have this VHS tape. So he plays the video VHS tape, and while the VHS tape, while the fight's going on, and he gets a phone call and picks up the phone. He goes, yeah, oh, yes, sure, I can do that. Okay, yeah, no problem. And he hangs up the phone. And he goes, okay, kid, I want you to go downstairs in that grassy area and you know, throw some punches and kicks or something, and let me see what you can do, right? So I went downstairs and I'm shadow boxing and I see the I, I see the straggly haired guy watching um, his messy hair like I have. So yeah. um, I see him watching and I'm I'm shadow boxing and kicking and kneeing and stuff like that and and just you know doing my thing. And he goes, "Okay, come back upstairs." So I ran back upstairs. He goes, "All right, so." Wednesday, I want you to come back. You're going to do a wardrobe fitting. I want you to meet Michelle. We're going to set up a schedule for you to do, you know, some training sessions with her. And I said, I'm sorry, what? He goes, you got the job, kid. <laughs> Just like that. You got the job, kid. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. Okay. Wonderful. And I had no idea what that what meant. meant. <laughs> I had no yeah. idea. What was what was in front of me? What I what was needed to be done? I had zero clue on how to choreograph fight scenes for a movie. Zero clue. Zero. So I I run downstairs and I uh, I get to my car and I I drive all the way back to Bakersfield, which is 112 miles away. And uh, well, I first I talked to the production company and I said, look, uh, I've got a fight on Showtime in um i don't know in a few weeks is it okay if i do this fight and then come back and and start my all, all the training and everything with the michelle factor then and they go yeah sure no problem we can wait a couple weeks no big deal thank god so i um i go back home and i get ready and i i contractually we agreed to go you know anytime you're going to go somewhere outside of where you live I always want 10 days of acclimation before before the fight. So I go up to Lake Tahoe, and that's where we're fighting, up in Harris Tahoe. And this wasn't a title fight or anything. It was just a regular kickboxing bout. And um, I'm up there for, I think, seven days, and I get a phone call from Warner Brothers, and they're saying, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer wants to, wants to work with you. Can, you. can you come tomorrow at this time? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'll be there. No oh, problem. God. And I hang up the phone and be like, oh, crap, now what do I do? <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm up in Lake Tahoe, and I, 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 gotta, I, I went to everybody that I knew, and I scraped together whatever money I could find to get an airline ticket to fly all the way to Burbank. So I flew to Burbank the day, very next day, and I, in the airport, I see this beautiful little white coffee mug with a black cat on it, and it's all fierce and mean-looking, right? And it, the caption beneath it read, piss me off and suffer the consequences. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this would be fun. I should give this to Michelle. This would be cool, yeah. right? Because she's Catwoman, right? And I thought, this is going to be awesome. And it's a black cat. So yeah. I get all the way there, and I, I go to the door, and uh, I, I, I'm about to knock on the door. and the, It's ajar. And inside, I hear who I think is Michelle Pfeiffer, and she's just – livid she is super angry somebody screwed over something really bad and she's just giving that person the what fur 
she's pissed. And I'm thinking, crap, now what do I do? <laughs> right? I'm about to meet Michelle Pfeiffer for the first time and she's really yeah. angry. And I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> well, it wasn't the first time, it was the second time. But anyway, um, I wait till there's a natural break in the conversation. And when I hear silence for you know a couple seconds, I go, knock on the door real quick. And she goes, oh, I, I think my trainer's here. I gotta go, click. And she comes to the door and I don't know, maybe she saw the look on my face and she goes, oh my God. How much did you hear? <laughs> and I said, uh, enough to know that somebody messed up really bad and, and, and screwed things up. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you had to hear that. And I said, look, I got a mug. Right? I'm, I'm holding it up to her. And she grabbed the mug and she pulled it out of the packaging because I'm like, here's my peace offering. <laughs> Please don't yeah. kill me. Right? And she tears open the packaging and she looks at them and she goes, Oh my God, this is so perfect. Thank it's you so pretty much. Appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, she had to laugh, right. Cause given the situation, she had to laugh and she, she used that mug every single day on the set. She had that mug with her oh, whenever she would awesome. drink her coffee, she drank coffee and you know, I found out later because uh, then I, I went and I was talking to Tim Burton and we're getting ready, you know, to under, you know, to to figure out all the different scenes and where the fights are going to be and how to how to choreograph them and you know, the first I walked into the sound stage in Warner Brothers and it's completely empty, like gutted, right? And then to watch an entire city with electricity and streets and fire hydrants that actually worked and buildings that you could actually walk into and you know see apartment complexes and everything else. It was unbelievable. It's like this complete blank canvas and they painted this gorgeous city, but it was real. Inside a soundstage, this is a real city. It's absolutely incredible to watch all of that being built. Um, and you know, I, I remember um, sitting down with Tim Burton and the guy who I had asked directions for to find where Max Clevin's office was, that was Tim Burton, who I had asked directions. <laughs> and he got on the phone to Max while I was upstairs with him and said, can yeah. you bring her down so that I can see what she can do? And when he saw me, when he saw me shadow boxing, he went, like this to Max, and I didn't see that part, and I got hired right it's, down there on the spot. Yeah, so don't 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 uh, don't judge a book by its cover. You never know who's who on a set. That's why. Or a, a that's studio. why you treat everybody with respect, no matter what. Yeah, like Muhammad that's Ali you said, you know, treat treat the, treat the waiter good, and if someone doesn't treat the waiter good, they he, he Muhammad Ali wouldn't deal with them. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what was uh so what what was Michelle like? What was Tim Burton like? Tim Burton. What was Michael um, Keaton like? I mean, Batman. Yeah. People don't. I mean, there's people <laughs> watching my age now. Batman was a big <laughs> deal. Yeah, the jet. Car it was a big was, deal. I mean, that was a huge thing for Warner Brothers. Uh, I remember to watch the first, or maybe Batman Returns. I think it was Batman Returns. I waited like three hours in line to get into the what? movie theater. Wow. Yeah, three hours. They had, they, in line? That's crazy. Yeah, and they had a, they had a, uh, I think they had the jet, the you know, the Batmobile from the first two films. They had a replica outside. I mean, media was there. Cool. Like I think I remember going to an AMC theater, and it was a forever line just to get in and watch it. So, what was it like? What was what was Michelle yeah. like? What was Michael Keaton like? Michelle had this this fire in her eyes that was just, uh, you know, uh, unstoppable in that respect. I mean, she was such a professional. We both learned how to use the whip together, but I'm left-handed and she's right-handed. So all the whip work was her, even though, you know, they would have had me double her in some areas of using the whip, but because I'm left-handed and she's right-handed, you know, but she, all the whip work that you saw her do in the film, you'll have to go back and watch it. All the whip work that, that was done in the film, she did it 
we we both trained under Anthony De De Delanges. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and, I know. Yeah, good guy and great great teacher for for the whip. And you know, I I would actually take that whip because we both got the whip to to practice with at home. And I would line up my little kid students, and they'd stand there like this, superstars, super still, right? And I'd whip it next to them, and I'd practice wrapping it around them, right? And they never got hurt ever because in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, pressure's on. This is a little child. You cannot yeah. hurt the child. <laughs> Pressure was super high. But I became really good at it because I knew that I could not hurt them. I cannot mm -hmm. do that. Not now, were you, were you so, teaching her a few, I mean, a few times or quite regularly? Were you teaching I her like trained her for, I trained her for months. And... I trained her in Kung Fu Sun Tzu as well as kickboxing. And we just did uh, all kinds of cool stuff. I wanted to, you know, my first time working with her, I just did an assessment to see what her physicality level was, what her flexibility was, and what she could do and what she could not do. So I choreographed all the fight scenes according to what she was good at, period. And, you know, there were times when, you know, you could see me, uh, if you saw, like, Michelle from or a cat woman from behind a lot of times that was me but um, some of the harder things like uh, when he when he hit Michelle and knocked her down and then she looked up and said how could you I'm a woman right and then she kicks him as he walks up to her oh I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> you know the gentleman in him is like oh crap I you are a woman I'm sorry right yeah. and, and then she kicks him well that was me kicking him but you know, there were so many areas in the fight scenes that were happened that were all her. And she was such a great, a great person to work with because she took her, you know, how I say you apply your Kung Fu to everything you do. Mm -hmm. She applied, she applied her professionalism, her Kung Fu to learning how to do that and make sure that she looked good in the fight scenes. She was fantastic. Loved working with her. And she, she was good to you. She was gracious to you. She was a good uh, person to work with. Did, did you have no idea how, how good to me she was. She found okay. out that I had to spend my own money to go to Burbank when I was up in Lake Tahoe getting ready to fight in three days. And I spent my own money to fly all the way down. And she did not know that I had, that I had asked the production company to let me start training her after I got back. She didn't know that. So she wanted to have a training session and I spent my own money, came back to see her, you know, trained her and then flew back to Tahoe <laughs> and had the fight. And because I was willing to do that on my own dime and not say anything and not say, no, I'm sorry, I can't, blah, blah. Did you talk to them? No, I, I didn't do any of that. I just said, yes, I'll be there. So she went to the production company and said, I would like her paid for every single day that she's on the set. Whether she works or she doesn't work, I want her paid every single day of filming, period. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So, That's great. That's great to hear. She knew that cool I went out of my way, so she decided to go out of her way. And, you know, I was treated so well by Warner Brothers. I remember my stereo getting stolen out of my car in the parking lot. And there are signs everywhere, you know, do not leave valuables in your car. We're not responsible. You know, make sure your doors are locked, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, you know, I didn't, I remember making a comment to one of the grips, I think in the film, it's like, damn, somebody stole my stereo out of my car. I'm really bummed. And they go, Oh, where was it? And I was parked on the lot. And goes, Oh, that's, that really sucks. And I saw the sign, so I didn't say anything more. Next thing you know, the production company is calling me in the office, and I walked in, and Tim Burton's there, and he hands me a check for $1,000. He goes, here, I understand your stereo got stolen out of your car. Why don't you spend the rest of the money after you buy your stereo and buy an alarm? <laughs> and I said, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I will. Well, Tim Burton sounds like kind of a funny guy. <laughs> He's a super I don't know funny that, guy. I don't know that much about he's, him, to be honest, but that's pretty oh my interesting. God. He's so creative. 
I mean, just the things he comes up with off the top of his head is just amazing. Super creative guy. Every time we would sit and talk about, you know, we would he would bring bring me to an area where there's going to be a fight scene, and we'd just talk about how it should go, and what his envision, what his idea was, and how we could make that work. And like I said, I walked into that never working on a film ever in my life. I knew how to choreograph, um, you know fight scenes in a in a for martial arts but never for film so yeah. it was just a it was a learning experience for me you know i didn't say i don't know how to do this so i'm not going to do it i didn't say anything like that i just said yeah i'll do it and i just figured figured stuff out as i went because i had no clue zero yeah Oh, I think there's good. Experience. I think there's some good lessons uh, here about just how you approach life. Um, that's that's pretty cool. You know that song? You, it you, you had your whip. You you had your Catwoman outfit too. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know. I'm just thinking. You said sometimes behind. So is there like a butt to butt comparison between Michelle Pfeiffer and you? Like you go scene to scene to scene. Can you tell which one is? And yeah, what, um, what was the? I mean, that was a that was the first time a really super tight outfit, the superhero talking, type outfit was on a woman. I wore a really. I wore a G string. And I wore a G string, and um, <laughs> I had to put a whole bunch of baby powder inside in order to get it on. It, it fit oh that God. tight. It was just micro, micro thin. I mean, super thin. So it's they had to measure my wrist. The distance, the, the length from my wrist to my elbow, from my elbow to my shoulder, how big my biceps were, my how big my forearm was. Everything fits literally as tight as a tight, tight, tight pair of gloves. I mean, it was that tight. So everything was measured precisely to fit me and to fit her. And uh, we had we each had, Michelle had three pairs of boots. I had three pairs of boots. Each pair of boot had spiked heels. And they were six hundred dollars a pair. Wow. Seven hundred dollars a pair. I take that back. Seven hundred dollars per pair. We each had three. Now there was another girl, uh, Trish Peters, who did the back handsprings and some of the stunts. Like I did some of the stunts. She did some. She um, she did not have to have heels. She had those fake heels that. You know, they looked like they were regular heels on the boots, but they were actually just little pieces of foam rubber type thing, right? Okay. <laughs> because she was doing more of the gymnastic type stuff, like the backhand gotcha. springs and whatever else. But all the fighting scenes, Michelle and I both did them wearing spiked heels. Crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Did you manage to so did you fun. manage to sneak anything off a set? Were you able to keep the suit or the heels or anything? They they did not let me keep the suit because they had to be used for displays all over. But yeah. they did let me keep one pair of boots. Ooh, all right. I'm just yeah. you know a little curious. I'm sure some <laughs> of our viewers are a little curious. They let <laughs> me keep one of the, they let me keep one of the whips also. Um, awesome. The whip that I practice with the most, you know, was uh, that was you know something I still have, which is good, and um, I've since gifted it. But they let me keep those two things, and Michelle Pfeiffer, which I still have, uh, made these beautiful sweatshirts, and just a simple sweatshirt, no hoodie or anything like that. But black on black was the bat, the cat, and the penguin. And it was all black on black. So you have to really look carefully to see it. But it looks like it's embroidered on. It was so well done. It was so beautiful. And, you know, then then we got Bob Kane. We got these Batman hats. And Bob Kane signed my hat. It was just so cool. And um, it, was, it was just an amazing experience all the way around. And Michael Keaton was kind of like a, kind of like a, a kid. Uh, more so than Michelle. I mean, he had a, a, he would kind of tease Michelle from time to time, like a kid would do. But I remember one time his son, Michael Keaton's son came to the set yeah. and it was a closed set. So not too many people were allowed to come onto the set unless they were, you know, they, they were previously either invited or allowed and they had to have permission. 
because it was always a closed set. And Michael Keaton's son came, he was about eight years old. He goes, he says to his, Michael Keaton says to his son, you see that girl right there? She's a five-time world. I wasn't a five-time. I was like a three-time world kickboxing champion at that point. But anyway, long story short, he goes, she will kick your ass. <laughs> I was like, why do you tell an eight-year-old boy that some woman's going to kick his ass? It's like, I don't know. I thought it was kind of funny. Because <laughs> what's Mr. the eight-year-old eight boy thinking? What's wrong with that woman? I, I think, why would she want to beat me up? I mean, honestly... That first movie, um, Michael Keaton was probably the best Batman. Both both the best Bruce Wayne and Batman, because others have done like one or the other fairly well, but not be both Batman in the suit well and Bruce Wayne well. And I, I you know, I was a big fan of Michael Keaton growing up. Um, so Gung Ho, Mr. Bomb, uh, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And he's still playing the Falcon and, and, and other movies. Uh, I think that's his character in other movies uh, now in the Spider-Man movies and all that. So um, that's pretty cool, Kathy. That's, that's a really cool experience. And that takes me back to my childhood a little bit. Um, yeah. What, you know, where did the, I was, was going to say, say, where did the movies I, go from there? Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, well, just real quick. You know, the times, because Michelle Pfeiffer and I had different shaped noses, so I had to wear a prosthetic nose that was Michelle's, so that it would be difficult to tell apart tell us apart. And I I was maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch taller than her, maybe, and we were both about the same size. So in that respect, it was once we had the outfits on, and I had her nose on, it was not that easy to tell us apart. Um, yeah. But. While I was sitting in the dressing room getting my prosthetic nose put on, next to me was Danny DeVito getting his penguin outfit put on. It was so cool. <laughs> that guy, yeah. and he was Michael. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. Danny DeVito was so down to earth, such a sweetheart of a guy. You would never think that he was a movie star because he was just really down to earth and super, super, super nice. Great guy. And yeah. you know, because I was still fighting, Warner Brothers. Uh, would allow me, they would make sure that there was always um, brown rice and uh, roasted chicken and fresh vegetables there for me to eat. Even though there was, you know, I had ample opportunity to eat all the junk that was there because there was plenty yeah. of that too. But you got to you know, avoid craft always... services and save it for the actual food. That's the key. Right. Right. But, you know, they were, they were really kind in that they allowed me to go run and shadow box and, you know, do whatever training I could do while I was on the set. And they allowed me the time to do that because they knew that I was a professional fighter. And that was another wonderful thing that Warner Brothers did. Just good people, really good people that I worked with. Well, um, I was thinking, why don't we take a two-minute break and uh, guys stay tuned on Spotify and all the podcast options. Stay tuned. Let's take a two-minute break. And come back and talk a little bit more about some of the other movies. I watched The Stranger, which had one awesome line in it. Um, and then I, I also want to briefly have you talk about your MMA fights and why you came back a couple times to get back in the arena and, and do MMA. Um, uh, you worked, I worked with you once showing you some of my uh, cage tactics and cage tactics and stuff over at Gokors. And... Um, and uh, oh, we gotta we gotta get a little bit in about what it was like to commentate the first UFC. So let's talk a little bit more about movie stuff and then some MMA stuff. But why don't both of us uh, guys please stay tuned on podcasts and we'll just take like a quick minute and a half, two minute break. Sound good? Sound good. All right, guys, let's watch me prepping for the movie Real Steel right before I rolled with Sugar Ray Leonard, who Kathy uh, mentioned before. Uh, I was there. Sugar Ray came in for all the media. Let's watch me uh, as the robot Metro in the film Real Steel. Here we go. Video speed. Speed. Thank you. Three, two, one, action. Yes! 
Jab. Good. Duck. Punch him. Ting ting. Go to your corner. Help yourself up. Grab the rope. Start to get up. And ding, ding, ding. Bell saved you. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed it. Kathy will be back in one minute. Uh, she will take questions. Uh, we're going a long time, but I'm really enjoying the conversation. It seems like you guys are too. Um, so, uh, we'll try to talk a little bit more about some movie stuff and, uh, MMA, both as a commentator for the very first UFC. Uh, she did win two MMA fights and, um, find out what she's doing uh, nowadays. So I'm sure she's coaching, uh, as always, and things like that. So let's welcome her back, Miss Kathy Long. Thanks. Let's find out a little bit more about some of the movies uh, you've been involved with and stuff. I said I watched The Stranger the other day, and I actually I kind of enjoyed it, guys. It's on YouTube. But there was one awesome line in there. I, I think it was a great line in the way you handled it. And that was they said – what what killed them? You know what your response was? Curiosity. That was a great line. <laughs> and the other one was bad manners. I thought that That's was right. so awesome. So curiosity That's killed right. the cat. You're Kathy Long, cat woman, uh, and then um, bad manners. Well, I, I, think, I thought that I was think a great what they line. said is was I think the question was, do you know who killed the cat brothers or something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Corny I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I thought the two main bad guys in that, the main bad guy, I thought he was pretty interesting, you know, for for a bad guy. And then he, even his, his co-main bad guy was going like, uh, you know, I went to Harvard and this and that. Like I thought they were <laughs> kind of kind of cool. I thought that I thought those guys were kind of cool. And he even had a pretty young Danny Trejo. I had a scene in kind of a scene and he was outside shooting killing all the russians except for me on uh the tv show <laughs> sons of anarchy when uh Opie yeah. need me in the balls um so uh you know young danny trejo is in it too so that must have been fun and you had a pretty good looking outfit you know i must say <laughs> in, in that Thank movie you. throughout that movie as well yeah that that film was a blast to do. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, we filmed it in a, a tiny little area in, in Nevada. I think it was called uh, Tonopah, Nevada. That's it. And I think the population there was maybe 700. <laughs> so it was a tiny, tiny little town. I don't know how they even found it, but it was such a cool, cool place to be. And, you know, there was, um, it was a low budget and we all knew that, but, you know, we all just, you know, dove in and worked really hard and, and made sure that we could make it look as, as good as we possibly could. Um, we knew it was a rip off of High Plains Drifter, you know, the plot, but, you know, what the heck, it's a movie. It was fun. And we got, and we all got paid. And, and the, the producer, Don Borchers, he, uh, he was also the accountant, um, and he, the sad part was, you know, he would try to, in order to make sure that things were run correctly and it could actually be, you know, finished and put in the can and then, you know, edited and, and get ready. And he would cut corners a little bit. And one of them was food. We were doing a, a, a night shoot for a week. We had to shoot in the middle of the night instead of during the day yeah. for various scenes that they wanted done. And people were so angry at the fact that there was 
no coffee, no no craft service, no nothing. That's, that's a sad <laughs> so, set, especially on a night shoot. People get grumpy around two thirty a.m. That's when everyone starts getting you grumpy. Know it. If you don't you have coffee it. and at least pizza brought out, it's a bad scene. Something. I mean, I've, I've worked in the industry a while. That's oh yeah. Ooh, that's well, you know what I that did. It was probably pretty rough. After the first night, because people were really, really grumpy and were talking about just leaving, right? And I was like, so the very next day, um, because we're all supposed to be sleeping during the day, I shot into town and uh, to to a slightly bigger town, and I went to a deli and I bought. I bought like 50 sandwiches of various kinds and I bought a whole bunch of boxes of chips and I bought cases of water and I bought all kinds of coffee and food and stuff. Um, and I, I loaded it all up in my, in somebody's like one of the, uh, um, cause in the films they rented trucks. So I threw it all in the truck and I drove it there and, and so that everybody could have, you know, at least food and waters and stuff to munch on and whatever else. It was just kind of bad because I remember, I remember um, the next night in craft service, um, we we're starting to get low on food again. Of course, you know. So uh, somebody went to the to the producer and who happened to be sitting among everybody, and they grabbed a a bowl of something, of chips or something, and just dumped it on his head. They were so angry at the producer, who, yeah. who was, you know, he didn't do it on purpose. He was just trying to make sure that everything was done, right? And yeah. he didn't yeah. he, he didn't think about it. He, he, it's like you don't realize that when you're working night shoots, you know, and, and you've got to have things that will keep you awake, like coffee, and you got to have food, yeah. and you got to have water, and you got to have you know, just the basic amenities <laughs> Shooting. And, and people might so put up with it one night, but they ain't putting it up with five nights in a row. People would have. They're not. Walked They're off definitely set. not. Yeah. So I remember, I remember one of those nights. Um, we were out of coffee, and the director, who wasn't there that particular night, he, I gave him a coffee maker, you know, as a gift. I gave him a coffee maker and some specialty coffees and different creamers and stuff like that, you know, just as a gift. Um, and he kept it in his trailer, and he and I had a key to it. So one of the one of the guys working on on the film, um, maybe in lighting or electrical, I don't remember, but he was standing there and he says, "Man, I would do anything for a cup of coffee right now." And I said, "Really? <laughs> anything?" He goes, "Oh man, I'm just dying. I really need a cup of coffee." So I said. Huh? Would you be willing to streak down the street with nothing, with not. nothing on for a cup of coffee? <laughs> and exactly. he goes, "Oh man, I'm telling you, I would do anything for a cup of coffee right now." And I said, "Oh man, it's a shame we don't have any." And I slipped away, and I went to the director's trailer, and I made a nice, fresh, hot, piping cup of coffee. <laughs> oh no! And I'm walking back to the set, right? And I had the coffee behind me. And I said to everybody, Shh, I watch. Right. So yeah, I said, so did you say again that you'd be willing to streak down the street naked for a cup of coffee? It was, I'm telling you, man, I would do anything for a cup of coffee right now. And I said, do you want to do it after you drink this or before? <laughs> and it was like, oh, man, oh, man, you got to do it now. You got to do it. Oh, my God. <laughs> We had fun, oh, yeah. and I, I went to the two police officers because we had to close down the road, and I went to the two cops on either end of the, of the part where we had it closed off, and I said, hey, the, this this guy just lost a bet, so he's got a street down the street. Are you okay with that? He goes, oh, I'll just turn the other way because I don't want to look at that. I said, oh, <laughs> cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked back over, and I said, okay, let's do it, and you know what he did? He stripped completely naked except for his tennis shoes, and he lightly jogged down the street, taking his oh, time. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was hilarious. Does he know yeah. there's going to be a there's going to be a 20, uh, 25th anniversary soon of uh, of the movie and it's going to be in the outtakes on the Blu-ray? 
Is it really? Oh, my God. That's, that's really well, funny now. That's that really funny. Yeah. It wasn't filmed, that's, obviously. Yeah. That's funny. That's that's too funny. I mean, good thing it was a small little town. Um, <laughs> that's and too funny. And nobody was there. And, you know, it was, it was great. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Got to have some fun, uh, right? But, you know, there's a little something lesson here about pay it forward here. You had Michelle Pfeiffer taking care of you, and then you, you know, you're, you've always been sweet, and you try to take care and, and get people food and water uh, and all that. So I think that's also a nice little lesson here. So um, is there yes, anything quick you. about any any other movies? or are you? Oh, you know what? Uh, I saw you were uncredited and you kicked uh, Mickey and Mallory and Natural Born Killers. You, did you kick Mickey uh, on the ground or something and Natural Born Killers? Yes. yes. I also helped choreograph the fight scenes in the diner with uh, Juliette Lewis, and that was fun. Yeah. Um, I haven't watched that movie in forever, and there is a director's cut of that. I need to see if I can... I don't know if I've seen the director's cut. I think I have. And I think it's quite a bit different. So I'll have to rewatch that. I haven't watched that in, in quite a while. It was a great film. Um, yeah. It was any, any, any other, what, any other quick tidbits about any other TV or movie sets you've been you on? Know, there, was, mention, there, was a, there was a film I worked on. Um, gosh, the name, and of course the name just went right out of my head. Yeah. Um, so there was natural natural born killers, Death Becomes Her, and Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion. Now, Death Becomes Her had, um, um, damn, <laughs> my mind's going to mush. And Sarah, that's okay. You mentioned Romeo and Michelle for the sequel years later. I actually did a print ad for him with like ten people trying to get in a VIP line, and they're like ducking under, like sneaking. Maybe that was the bouncer or something. And they're they're sneaking under the thing, uh, oh, they, under the, like the, right. the red velvet yeah. rope. So I could actually like I was in a hired to be in like a still photo for Romy and Michelle sequel. I think because I remember on my early early resume to fill up my acting and stunt resume, I had like that listed at the bottom somewhere. So so that's kind of funny. That's you cool. did something on Romy and Michelle, huh? <clears throat> yeah, I just did a. Uh, they were taking a kickboxing class, and so they used mm. our, our, our the gym that I was teaching at, Bodies in Motion in Pasadena, and I was the kickboxing instructor, <laughs> which was fun. Yeah. So let's get into UFC a little bit because commentating UFC 1 I want to ask about, and then you, you eventually did two MMA fights. I didn't even know you had the second one until the other night, to be honest. I was trying to get you a second fight. Um, when, when we were working together a little bit, um, and then, then I, I see now that you did, which is crazy considering you were the commentator for the first ever UFC and uh, let's see, what, September 3rd, 1993, September 16th, something like that. Um, what was, no, it was, uh, uh, I think it was in October. Was it October? Okay. So uh, 90, end of 1993. How did you get that gig, and what on earth were you thinking? And were all three of you like, is this on the up and up? Is this really a thing? Did you guys know that this was, like, really going to happen? No rules and no weight classes, no time limits, all that? Well, you know, because because I'm a master in Kung Fu San Su, you know, I, I understand the the concept of fighting fighting with no rules, but it's not really fighting. Um, I mean, they did have rules. They did. There were just very, very few rules. Very um, no biting, but, no eye gouging, and I think that was it. Well, no strikes to the windpipe and stuff like that, but, you know, okay. um, the vital targets. <clears throat> Although you could hit to the groin. Yeah. I remember that. You could hit to the groin in that fight. So there was, you know, pretty close, pretty close to no rules. Pretty close. Um, but... I, at the time when I was offered the, the I, I just got a call out of the blue asking if I'd be willing to commentate. And I said, yeah, sure. Why not? Cause I like, I like commentating. Um, and I remember the rules meeting and in the rules meeting, there were questions that were asked by the fighters 
for example, uh, the boxer whose name is escaping me. Uh, he, uh, the, yeah, no, I, I'm one. forgetting the names. Yeah. yeah. So he, he said, well, do I wear both gloves or should I just wear one glove and, and do I wrap my hands or should I just wrap my hands and not wear any gloves? And you know what the answer to that was? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. This is a rules meeting. Yeah. And I, the answer being, I don't know. Right? So I think there was a lot of Oh, Art Jimerson. I'm sorry. It was it was Art Jimerson, I think. Yeah, you're right. It is Art Jimerson. So anyway, I yeah. think the way they were they were touting uh, how they set up the fights was they were going to pick the top representative of each of these disciplines and have them compete against uh, the Gracie. Right. So they did not pick the top sumo wrestler at that time. They did not pick the top boxer who was Mike Tyson at the time. They did not pick, you know, the best karate fighter at that time who was somebody else. I mean, they, I, I think they were offering X amount of dollars for anybody who could, who could win in this non, no rules tournament. Right. And that was the draw to win however much money it was. I think it was 30 yeah. grand or so, 30 grand. Or yeah, something. it was 50 I, I grand. You weren't getting Mike Tyson for 50, 50 grand. grand to win three fights. <laughs> exactly. So I was I was a little concerned by the fact that they were saying they're picking the top representatives of these disciplines, but they didn't. And I thought, huh, okay. <clears throat> so it's a little weird about that, but I just thought, oh, let's see what happens. <laughs> right? Uh, but in the rules meeting, I remember there was a lot of questions asked and there was a lot of answers of, I don't know. And you had you, your commentators were uh, Jim Brown and Bill Wallace were with you, right? Yes, <clears throat> yes. Okay. And so, Bill Wallace had ahead. the he had the ears to the to the production crew. Um, so Jim Brown and I did not have we're, we did not have the capability of hearing what the production crew was going. So there were you know. <clears throat> I was getting upset a little bit at first because there were times when I'd try to say something and Bill Wallace would just run over the top of me. And, you know, I understood later after that. It's like, you know, okay, so he's hearing everything that's going on and maybe they're asking him to talk about something X, Y, Z. And it, I guess to Bill that meant he was going to run over the top of me. And I was a little frustrated by that. But overall, you know, being able to watch the fights and see actually what was going on, I, I just kind of felt like – it was the Gracie show. <clears throat> yeah. Did you have that a was my oh thought. my god? Did, did, did you have any big oh my god moments when watching the fights? Was there? A, <laughs> watching, I, I think there was one. Watching the right? tooth fly past me. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Telly Tuli yeah. and uh, Mister I gouge himself. Uh, Gerard Gordeau. Um, yes. That had it been like oh my goodness? Did you guys really see the tooth fly by you guys? I really did. I saw it. I don't know if anyone else did, but it definitely flew right past me. I thought, holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> um, yeah, and production-wise, guys, I commentated uh, the first five live Pancreas events, UFC Fight Pass, 270 to 276. And, and, and there's struggles, and people on Twitter and even a girl you know talking bad about me on, on Twitter later and stuff, they don't really – you never really know what's really going on. Like in one of the intros, I remember – we went over it three different times. No, we're going to go to this. And then I'm having a cover live in my intro when they failed to show the video, the 20, 25 second video that they promised was going to be rolling at that time and, and stuff like <laughs> right. that. And you got people in your ear and my, my first event, like I, I, uh, I had just flown from America last minute. I'm jet lagged and I'm talking about a fight that I didn't know was canceled a guy got injured. I was trying to plug a UFC upcoming event and one of the, the fights had just got fell out. Well, I didn't have oh, time man. between going to the venue early to not, you know, and they're like, Oh, they're so upset and very mad. Cause it was probably like uh, Joe Silver or someone, you know, still at the UFC at the time probably was like, no, that's wrong. And like, 
Well, guys, I was on an airplane. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't, you know? get the update, I didn't you know. know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I had to make an apology after and stuff. And, you know, especially, you know, just sometimes, especially a first event like UFC or my first event with, with Pancras being live, it's not always as easy as everyone thinks, you know. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, but you did get the feeling it was it was the Gracie show. This is Henner, uh, not Henner, Horian's uh, kind of here. He has grace of jujitsu to the world. Yeah, and yeah. you know it's not that that jujitsu itself is the be all end all, um, but I I'm the kind of person that you know if you get on the ground with somebody, if if you're out in public and, and what if they have friends who will come and, you know, continue stomping on you while you're on the ground with them, you know, your Brazilian jiu-jitsu isn't going to do much good. And I, I, I have a secret service and uh, special forces friends who filmed a guy who was doing uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu in a fight against somebody in, in Iraq where they were. And, the Iraqi pulled out a knife while the guy's trying to give him, you know, do an arm bar on him. He's trying to do the arm bar. This is a soldier. And he just pulled out the knife and stabbed him a bunch of times. It's like, okay, so you see where the arm bar isn't going to do much good if you're going to get stabbed 20 times? It just, you know. <clears throat> yeah, you have to be uh, well-rounded. Me and you both teach self-defense. You got to be well-rounded. Right. I mean, as a black belt in jiu-jitsu, I have to use somewhat defend it. But on the other hand, I have other black belts and I've done many other styles uh, and I have real right. world experience that tells me that tactically isn't uh, always the best option because you don't know about multiple opponents. You don't know about weapons that uh, you know may be involved or going for your own weapon if you carry one like I do. Uh, you yeah. know, and so those are the things I try to address in my uh, my combat is a street jiu-jitsu DVD. I'm, I'm not fanatics and law enforcement. I just want to. Trust me, I'm not. So I'm you not poo-pooing Brazilian. Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm not poo-pooing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but it is not the ultimate self-defense. It is not the ultimate martial art. You know, there it is a good one, but it's not the ultimate in that respect. It's like just there's no there there is no one martial art that is the absolute yeah, yeah. be all end all. Sorry, there just isn't. Um, that's why you need to be the most well-rounded martial artist and or fighter you can be so that you understand every aspect of what can which, come out of you. Which I think is what UFC showed. It was kind of more like, oh, got to be jujitsu right away. But by UFC 8, 9, 10, we're seeing guys like Don Fry that was a boxer wrestler with some judo experience coming in. We're seeing Marco who has UFC 7. Oh, we lose your livre, which basically meant like catch wrestling plus Muay Thai kickboxing. Um, right. uh, you know, we started to see, oh boy, and then eventually Maurice Smith comes along and kicks my friend Mark Coleman in the head. And then everyone's like, yep. okay, we really should get on this kickboxing thing. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, oh yeah, that's probably a good idea. It's good idea. to be as well rounded as possible, yeah. Because I, I think that because of the sport, you know, it really has um, forced the hand of higher quality fighters, you know, to to be to be in competition. Because if you have a weakness, it will be exploited. Yeah. No Absolutely. And you, you know, now the level in, in women's MMA, all MMA is getting really high. Like uh, people yeah. are comparing you um, to, to Valentina Shevchenko, who I think is the one, yeah, 125 pound champion. And you guys move quite a, a, a bit similarly. She's got good hitting power, very good movement. Um, her grappling's gotten better where she can like headlock, hip throw, uh, ogosh people to the ground with good timing and, and, and stuff like that. And, um, you know, she, she could she could beat up some guys. I mean, I think Amanda Nunes, uh, she would knock out so too. quite a few <laughs> of the male champions. Her boxing is legit. Um, you've seen her hands. So, I mean, these women are – or something else nowadays, and and you know they they should give you respect that you really kind of paved the way I think uh, for them in in a, in a lot of ways as well. That's really kind of you to say, and I I'm just very fortunate that during my fighting career I did get media coverage, and 
that helped a, a tremendous amount um, to bring, you know, recognition for the sport of any any contact sport in that respect. Uh, that women can fight just as well as men do, and maybe even better in some areas, in some ways, but just depending. I, I'm really grateful yeah. that I was allowed the media coverage and I got to do what I got to do. Yeah. yeah, in fact, they're asking about your bouncer stories, which I think women are more efficient fighters because naturally, yes. because they're not as concerned of looking cool to everybody. They're vicious, grab hair, claw eyes, like kind of instinctively as a mammal. I think women are more like direct and violent in, in real fights versus men that are like trying to like, okay, I can show I kind of know crappy boxing. Like I think is what a lot of guys do in street fights. So um, uh, let's get the, the I, I want to hear any bouncer stories and what that was like, but 16 years later about after commentating the first UFC, you get in there and you do an MMA fight. What, what drove you to do that? And what was uh, your two MMA fights like? Um, when I, I was first asked by Scott Coker with, uh, IKF and not IKF, I'm with Strikeforce. He asked me if I wanted to get involved with Strikeforce. And at that time, because I felt like the UFC was more like the Gracie show, I just thought, nah, I'm not interested, which is, you know, I, I look back and I think. I, I kind of regret not not accepting it, but um, it just it just wasn't uh, I just wasn't ready for it at the time, and so be it. You know, you you can't uh, you can't always be uh, ready for everything that comes up. You try to be sometimes, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And in, at that time in my life, I was you know training fighters and in kickboxing, and I just felt that I was too busy and wouldn't have been able to dedicate the time needed and necessary. So. That being said, um, years later, I was at a, a – there was a huge gym that opened up in downtown Los Angeles called the Tap Out Gym. And um, Josh Barnett would bring his fighters in there. And I, I was watching the way he was training them. And trust me, when I left kickboxing, it left a horrible taste in my mouth. Um, just the way that my coach was horribly mean and abusive to me mm. and, you know, would call me a worthless piece of shit and, and on and on. So when I left kickboxing, you know, I kind of left fighting in, in general for a while and I just, you know, didn't want to be around it. But uh, later I got into boxing and then Muay Thai and then lastly in MMA. And I just thought, you know, before I'm too old, I'd like to give it a shot just to see what it's like and have, have some fun with it. I've been studying Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu since 1994 at that point. And this is, you know, a bit later. So I just thought, okay, um, I, I do, I've, I've studied wrestling on, off and on. I've been thrown by a lot of judo guys. <laughs> so, so I understand the judo concept, but I wasn't, you know, I can't say I was a good, good at judo, but I was certainly good at being thrown. Um, and I just thought, what the heck? I, I want to give it a shot just one more time before I can officially retire and say I'm done fighting, period. Doesn't mean I'm going to stop competing in things, uh, just not not stand-up sports that are d truly designed for young people. Um, so I got in there, and I just trained and trained, and then I got my knee blew out. Um, some kid who was – I was training with Eric Paulson, and some kid who uh, I didn't know wasn't – you know, because – Eric Posen has his fight training um, and then he has training for everything else. So when the fighters come and train, they're all amateurs and pro fighters. And what I didn't know was that this kid wanted to become an amateur fighter, but didn't know anything and was learning as much as he could, as fast as he could. And Eric put me with him and we were supposed to do boxing with takedowns. So we're boxing and then he goes to shoot for my leg and I'm, I got an underhook and I'm lifting him up. And as, as I start lifting him up, he immediately shifts his weight and slams all his body weight on my straight leg on the side and pop my knee, which, you know, that was at least a year. I had to have surgery and that was a year of recovering. Yeah. And after that, I thought, you know, okay, I'm still, I still want to try it one more time. So I, I trained for it, and 
Um, this is when I was training with, at Go Course. And I wasn't training with Eric Paulson at that time. So um, I remember millennia being another place where I was fighting, uh, where I was training. So between the two, Gokor and, and uh, not not Batiste, but who was the other one who was training? Romir um, and Javier Vasquez. Um, Romy. Yeah, he, yeah, they were both in my corner. And I remember Romy saying to me, no, it was Gokor. Batiste's story as well, maybe. Yeah, Batiste. But me. Batiste wasn't yeah. in the corner. Romy was, and so was Gokor. And I remember Gokor telling me, no matter what happens, you do not get on, don't, don't let her get you on your back, period. And I went, okay. And I remember her, she's a wrestler, right? So it's like, crap. And I remember her getting a hold of me and taking me down. And those, those words were drilling in my head. Yeah. Do not let her get you on your back. And I thought, oh, shit, I can't <laughs> let this happen. Boom. So I just reversed the role and got on top of her instead. You, you took the momentum and rolled it through. Yeah. 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 I just thought, uh, which okay, looks, I can't which, which back. was really great. A great highlight from the fight. And it's funny how you think of these things in fights. Um, oh, yeah. My second, my third fight, I was in Mount Key locking a guy, and I didn't know yet, well, some guys will take a lot in a fight, a top wrist lock, and I should have hopped off the side mount. And he bruised me so hard, he pushed me off. And I, I uh -oh. flowed and armbarred him hanging upside down, basically belly down, armbar in midair, and I tapped him out midair. Wow. Basically, but thinking wow. to myself, ah, uh, transition the other arm. <laughs> so um, it's funny <laughs> that self talk we've, we've talked about a, a few times, and it's like it's almost like a time distortion because you can think a long sentence and yet it's in the microsecond of reality. It, 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 it's it's kind of weird, it's so true. I mean, there are times, Dan, when I would be in a fight and all of a sudden my opponent's moving in slow motion, and I'm looking yeah. at them going. Holy crap! I could I could go have lunch and come back. By the, you know, I was just watching it, and in my mind, I'm going, "Wow, they're moving in total slow motion. This is bizarre." And but and you know, it fights, only lasts fractions of a second. It's but the the most like so when you're 15 minutes of a fight, or uh, I guess for you, 36 minutes of a fight, like uh, or that's boxing, whatever, kickboxing, five rounds, maybe five, 15 minutes. Um, no, 12 rounds for title fights. 12 threes, so 36. 12 twos. But those, yeah. but those those minutes seem – it's like the most time you're kind of alive because you have to be in a state of mood, like, mood, like, like so in the moment. Yes. I, I, it is like a, it's like a different time period, right? It's like, I don't know, a spatial distortion or something because – those times you're fighting are different. The time lasts a different amount of time, right? It's true. And when people are moving in slow motion, it's not that they're moving in slow motion. It's just that your mind is speeding is speeding up so fast that they look like they're moving slowly. Yeah, and that's probably time what can, it is. That that distortion that you have in your mind. I mean, it's it's something that I've witnessed before and experienced before several times. Like when I got into a car accident, the car was rolling in slow motion and I was watching everybody banging and hitting because they weren't wearing their seatbelts. You know, it's, it's kind of like that. It's very bizarre. Um, it's, but you're, yeah. it's your mind that's speeding up. It's not so yeah, much the, the time PCU slows down. Gets your mind processed up. More directly. The computer goes yes. up more because uh, through evolution or whatever, uh, you know, survival, uh, instinct, yep. I guess it's it's pure hyper focus, and you did roll her through beautifully. That's something I did myself. My thumb just got re cracked. I went against a uh, yeah. high level Tomiki Akito guy who uh, gets paid to teach our military and special forces. So I got a video coming out where uh, I, I went against him. I was bigger, and of course, having a, a, a he, he competed a lot in judo, but. I was able to roll him through the one time he kind of hit a uh, takedown on me, um, which is something I'm good at. But uh, we're running out of time. So I want to now uh, open it up to some questions. One of them was about okay. your boxing experience. So, Kathy, we only got 
15 minutes left and we got to wrap it up. Um, so quick bouncer story. What was bouncing like? Were you the cooler? Did you actually hit people? Were you wrist locking people out or were you being mean and nasty? Cause they would grab you and, and you grab their face and tiger claw their head back. Or what were you like Kathy as the bouncer? I was always, always tried to be the nicest person I could be. I mean, even when the, I, I'm looking at the bartender, because we had three three sections in, in the bar. There was the front door, so there always had to be two people at the front door, one to check ID and make sure they got money and, you know, they were the right person and blah, blah, blah. Then the main floor and then the back door. The back door was actually the um, – the back door was actually the front door to the restaurant so, and had a push bar. So – you had to watch the back door or we what we called the back door because, you know, people could let other people in without having ID and stuff like that or not paying their, their cover fee. And there always had to be somebody patrolling the back door. So at that point, um, I was – I always tried to be nice, but – I'd give them that first opportunity to be nice. And if they weren't being nice after that, then I'd, I'd hit them in the windpipe or pop them in the nuts really hard. And I'd, I'd palm claw their eye really hard. And from that point, I, I would, because, you know, it's interesting about drunk people. They have a delayed pain reaction. We're looking at five to seven seconds of a, de of a delay before they feel the pain. And then they're gorilla strong. So the last thing you want to do is let them get a hold of you, right? So <laughs> if I hit somebody in the windpipe, then I'd pop them in the nuts really hard, grab them by the hair, slam them down on the ground. And then by then, the two, my two other guys would be coming up to drag them out. And it was a situation like that all the time where I would always try to be nice first. Hey, buddy, let me buy you a drink tomorrow. Come back the next day. I think it's time to go home. Let me call you a cab, whatever. You know, I'd always try to be nice Jeez. first. Be if, nice. If I could. Until it's time to not be nice. Time to not be nice. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Thank um, you. Sensei Patrick Swayze, rest in peace. Yes. <laughs> um. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, I, go ahead. You were going to say that, something. Literally, someone asked this. Any thoughts? And that was from John Chipman, Sunshine Aikido. Thank you. And Kathy did get her first black belt in Aikido, I believe. Uh, in high yes. school or just shortly thereafter, yes. right? Um, we've got some Akidokas on here. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, have you seen a lot of people recently are breaking their legs, either getting their legs uh, checked, they're doing calf kicks, and some people are finally, after I've been teaching since 2012, how to check uh, calf kicks correctly or super low calf kicks or calf sweep kicks is Benny the Jet who I kind of got it from and then realized you can kick hard to actually do damage, not just sweep open the kick to get away with it uh, and kickbox certain kickboxing rules. Um, people have been breaking their legs recently and Connor breaks his ankle on Dustin Poirier's elbow tip. It looked like, do you got any thoughts about how to low kick without getting your legs broken has been happening. Chris Weidman, Anderson Silva, uh, Connor McGregor, it's happened to all of them. Well, it, it happened to me. I fractured my shin kicking this girl in her shins, but I deliberately kicked her in the shins. What you need to do instead is, um, if because I've been a massage therapist forever, um, there's a tendon that goes right along the outside of your leg. It starts at your hip, and it goes all the way down to your ankle. And just above the kneecap on the outside is where it's most exposed along with the ankle. So... If you were to kick somebody in the leg and weaken that tendon, you would kick just above the knee on the outside. And that would that would probably be the best kick you can do. But if they're going to check it, don't kick with your ankle because your shin goes all the way down through your ankle. But then where it's thickest is just below the knee. So if you're going to yeah. kick somebody, kick you know where the bone is the thickest. And that's what you want to use as your, as your weapon. But you know, when you're in the middle of the kick and you can't always gauge – you know, how it lands and where it lands, right? Or how they check or they don't check. So unfortunately, it is just one of those things that does happen. But you also have to ask yourself, what is their nutrition that they are, are, are is their bone density reducing? You know, is it getting actually thinner because of lack of proper nutrition? 
for uh, extra supplements, um, you can get osteoporosis from long, long-term steroid uh, anabolic steroids. So that could be yeah. uh, something uh, to look at it, as well. All right. Kathy, thanks. I'm Let's sorry. go on to the next question because we're running out of time. Sensei Emmett says, um, with martial arts so big on YouTube right now, do you have any favorite YouTube channels besides Dan the Wolfman? Besides Dan the Wolfman, um, yeah. I, I can't think of anybody else who's as cool as him. So I don't really watch. <laughs> there you really go from the else. five time world champion. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give myself a shameless plug. Do you remember we worked in the cage once at, at Gold Coast Highest Non Academy? I showed you some of my mean anti-cage tactics, the throat shove turnaround and the head twist. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. That was probably yes, like do. maybe 2013 or something. It has now been done in the UFC. Uh, Francis Nagano did it to Stipe Miocic in their first fight to get off the cage in wow. the first round. That None of the commentators – notice but i i want to give myself some validation here you love my nasty head twist off the cage and uh current ufc uh heavyweight champ francis nagano actually did it years uh later even after i uh showed you that kind of nastiness um guys any last questions we will take them now because we got to wrap up in about five six minutes uh for technical reasons so any last questions, uh, shoot them now. I think someone earlier had asked about uh, Aikido and uh, didn't know you had trained Aikido. That's from Remy, martial arts one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, and uh, Ron, also thank you for tuning in earlier. Uh, stuntman that's fought everybody. Viking Samurai uh, has got a good channel with 80s and 90s action stars. We're making the 80s great again, Kathy. So uh, I want to thank you very much for that. Uh, we got a young up and coming fighter I worked with, uh, just turned 14, Ashley Bashley. Uh, her dad's on right now, held Mitch for her the other day. So Kathy, you got a few minutes. What are you up to now? Are you coaching? Are you training? Are you doing healing? What's going on in the world of Kathy Long? And we only got a few minutes. Um, I am doing energetic healing work as well as massage massage and um i'm teaching kickboxing but i'm not really coaching anybody to fight right now um it's not something that has come up in the in the i'm leaning more toward um a mixture of both kung fu sansu which i want to get back to teaching again and uh and teaching kickboxing so i've just come up with a, a simple ranking system um, mm -hmm. through kickboxing and ultimately if you want to get your black belt in, in kickboxing or Muay Thai um, you have to have at least one amateur fight or a, a sparring match with somebody you don't know yeah do you um, you do you do, do some self-defense seminars uh, currently still as well if people want self-defense seminars or even even private lessons from you I'm, I'm sure um, stuff like that could be worked out, uh, correct. If anyone wants to contact you to do self-defense seminars or kickboxing seminars, is there a good way for them to get in contact with you? Yes. Uh, they can email me. Uh, they can go to, uh, Kathy Long EMA, which is for evolving martial arts at gmail.com. Okay. Or they can go to, uh, seattlewushu.org or G. And that's one of the school, that's school where I teach. SeattleWushu.org. Okay. Yeah. Seattle Wushu. And um, um, I'm going to say that email one more time. Kathy Long EMA at gmail.com, correct? Yes, that's it. Okay. And um, for the healing stuff as well, um, I, I believe you probably have something. I think even Eric Paulson has said you've helped him out with some back healing and stuff before. Am I correct on that? Yes. Um, however, Eric Paulson is a pretty accomplished healer himself. Oh, really? Um, okay. He's a he's he's a, a spiritual powerhouse. Let's put it that way. Maybe we can get Eric on. I'm sure my catch wrestling followers would uh, appreciate it. Maybe we can help get Eric on or Benny the Jet on if you can help uh, spread the word as my podcast hopefully grows uh, and guys will be a little more professional. Get a little studio and backdrop. Uh, and a better microphone and stuff in the very near future. 
uh, and uh, all that. So anything else you want to plug? we got a couple minutes left. They can email you um, or anything else um, you want to get out there. I'm definitely open to seminars if anyone's interested. Um, I've got a couple coming up next month and – you know, that's a great way to great way to reach me is Kathy Long EMA at gmail.com. Um, and uh, any other questions you want to ask, you're welcome to email me those too. Where are you where are you living now and where are those seminars gonna be at? The seminar is gonna be in Grand Junction, Colorado, and then the other one will be in Boston. Uh, I am living in uh, Renton, Washington right now, which is close to Seattle, Washington. Okay. Okay. Very good. I thought you were still in Cali, so I'm now in the know. Now you're in Kathy the know. Long, yes. <laughs> uh, it's been great to catch up with you. Uh, we've gone my longest podcast so far because I think everyone has enjoyed it. Um, pioneer of uh, just you know women's martial arts, self defense, kickboxing, MMA, commentating, paving the way. Uh, uh, I think Lauren might be getting in with UFC soon doing that and stuff like that. You've just been uh, paving the way. I'm glad I got to know you a little bit on a personal level. I wish you all the best. And thank you. Thank you once again. I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. You can always uh, catch it, replay it on YouTube, everybody. Give me and, and Kathy, help us out with the algorithm. Get down there in the YouTube comments, not the live comments. As this ends, put a nice comment in it for Kathy and me in the YouTube comments. And uh, we'll be on Spotify in a couple days. And my other podcasts are already up there. So that's it, guys. Please subscribe to Dan the Wolfman. Uh, hit up Kathy Long for seminars. Maybe me and Kathy can get together, bring us both in on a seminar. I just did a couple in uh, Clean, Texas. And on those videos will be coming your way. So maybe maybe Kathy can handle the stand-up and I can handle the groundwork. And we could do a, a duo seminar coming up. That would be pretty cool. And I, I think you got other people you do seminars with. Um, so anyway, that's it, guys, signing out. Again, thank you, Kathy Long. And I'll thank catch you. you on the flip side. Bye, everybody. Right, take care. Bye.